Episode 52. We made it. One year. It should have taken one year to get to 52 episodes releasing every Monday. It took me almost a year and a half. Shows you how on track I have been. But I'm trying to do a better job. So let's get into episode 52. My guest today is someone I'm very fortunate, I consider myself to be very fortunate to call a good friend. We met many, many moons ago when we were both involved with the CrossFit ecosystem. Specifically, uh, we were both teaching at the Conceptual Foundation Seminars, also known as the Level Ones, or that's what they were known as when we were teaching. Now, one thing I immediately recognized about Rob upon first meeting him was that he is exponentially smarter than I, uh, which doesn't take much in all honesty, but in Rob's case, it's a ridiculous margin between the two of us. And I have leveraged that many times over the years for my own personal gain because of the depth and breadth of his knowledge. I will ask questions that I have and because I have the access to him to ask questions and I get the answers that I'm looking for. So today, when we sat down to talk, I tried to talk about the things he is an expert in. And specifically, uh, I mean, to try to summarize and encapsulate really the world that he lives in, it would be the paleo or paleolithic diet world. It's not paleo, all right? I've heard many people say that over the years. I get it. It's not paleo. It's paleo. I think, unless I'm a total asshole, but I'm pretty sure it's paleo. I'm actually going to double check with Rob on that. My exposure to him was in that world. He often would give the nutrition lecture at the CrossFit seminars, and to say that I took notes would be an understatement. Since that time, uh, a lot of things have happened with Rob. He's a two-time New York Times bestselling author. He's got two books, The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat, and I'm going to put the links to both of those in the written description of this podcast. Before being an author, though, he was a research biochemist, and yeah, he wore a lab coat. He had the clipboard. I'll let him explain it because we talked about that in the podcast, but he came from the world of academia, and now he's considered to be one of the world's leading experts in, like I said, Paleolithic nutrition. Uh, he's worked with thousands of people, tens of thousands of people throughout the world. He's got a podcast on iTunes, and I got it right in front of me right here. It is called The Paleo Solution Podcast. I'll put a link to that as well. Like I said, a wealth of knowledge. Now, two things that we talked about specifically that I have done. Well, well one of them I'm halfway through doing. One of them we talked a lot about salt. And I have started drinking water in the morning with some salt in it. And I won't get into why because Rob explains that in the podcast. But it's been a huge help for me with my energy levels, which I normally would go straight to caffeine. So it's been interesting. I haven't been doing it that long, but I like the results that I'm getting. And the second thing that we talked about or that he brought up was a um, 23andMe, which is basically a DNA test. Um, but they have an option now that can give you some idea as to some food sensitivities that you might have. Now, I have zero connection with 23andMe at all, and I have the box sitting in front of me because I ordered it right after we were done talking, and I still haven't done it, of course. But it seems super simple, and I'm absolutely going to do it because I'm pretty sure I have some sensitivities to foods, um, and I base that just off of how I feel when I eat them, but I would love to get a little bit more concrete data when it comes to that. So 23andMe... I think it's just .com. I don't know. Go to 23andMe, uh, just in Google, you'll find it. If you're interested, and they have one of the kits, uh, not just the genealogy kit, but it's, I believe it's the genealogy and health or something like that, you'll see it's about 50 bucks more. But those are the two things we specifically uh, talked about on the podcast that I, one, like I said, the salt I've already started doing, and I'm glad that I did. The second one being the uh, 23andMe. You spit in a cup and then send it off, and they give you the results. So I'm just waiting to do that. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, or one supplement we didn't talk about, was Blue Chew. I know. I know. I didn't ask him, because I don't think it's part of the Paleolithic diet. For years, my take on the Paleolithic diet wasn't that you would eat only the things available 
to caveman. It was, if you had a reasonable expectation that a caveman would try it, you could eat it. So that's how I got around and I was eating Snickers bars and donuts and basically anything I wanted to, because I figured they were curious creatures and they probably would eat it. I bet you they would try a blue chew and who knows, maybe the human race would be a little bit different if they did, but I digress. So first off, thank you to blue chew for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. They are the first ever chewable that can bring your performance to another level. Now for many episodes, I was calling this a pill. It's not a pill. You put it in your mouth, you chew it, you swallow it. Okay. Who needs to have this type of supplementation? I don't know. Maybe people who are, maybe they're getting a little bit old. Maybe the, some of the internal systems and the wiring aren't working the ways that they used to, right? Maybe you need to go a few extra rounds, if you know what I'm saying. So Blue Chew essentially is a performance enhancement for the bedroom. It's got the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. So you know that they're going to work. They're chewable, so it works faster than a pill. You can take them any time of the day or night. Super weird if you're taking this at like 2 o'clock in the morning, I would say, right? Maybe time it a little bit better than that. But you can take it on a full stomach as well. Uh, it's cheaper than Viagra and Cialis. So that kind of makes it a no-brainer. If you go to bluechew.com, B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com, and you use the promo code HOT, upper or lowercase, H-O-T, what you're going to do is you're going to get your first shipment for free. And... It's going to cost you about five bucks for shipping, plus or minus a dollar, I'll say, on the shipping side of the house, which is cool because you don't have to go to a doctor's office. You don't have to sit there and, uh, you know, write out a reason that you're there to see the doctor. You don't have to wait in line in the pharmacy. It comes straight to your door. It comes in a little cardboard container, individually wrapped chews. It's pretty cool. So, again, the deal for listeners is if you go to bluechew.com, You'll get your first shipment for free when you use the promo code HOT, H O T. You're going to pay about five bucks in shipping and it's going to show up at your door. So try some salt, spit into a cup for your 23andMe, and then, you know, surf the internet. Surf on over to Blue Chew if you want to, if you need to. Surprise yourself. Or you can do what uh, a gentleman reached out via email and told me what he did is he ordered some for a good friend of his without telling him, which to me is amazing. I completely support that behavior. And uh, when he wrote back again saying that his neighbor was totally baffled and specifically his neighbor's wife was a little bit freaked out, I had a smile on my face for a very long time. So that is it. And on that note, let's get into episode 52 with Rob Wolf. My plan was to grill you, and here's the deal. I'm going to ask you questions, and I want you to pretend like I'm not actually asking for myself, <laughs> as if the <laughs> questions I have about nutrition and compliance and strategy, I need you to pretend that you haven't known me for so long and you can't see through the facade, that it's just me with my own <laughs> curiosity <laughs> peeking through. And remember the rules that I told you. You have to speak to me as if I'm a child. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then when I still don't understand the words, I'll go back. <laughs> That's where the backhanded slaps yes. happen. And y yeah. Perfect. Yes, indeed. Um, no, but actually, it's funny. I, I told some people I was coming to talk to you. I mean, you see this more than anybody. The amount of, what would you call it, information that is out there that is churned, that is misunderstood, that is com like two alternating concepts that are combined into the... I don't know, but what do you think about once a month the new thing comes out? Oh, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, yeah. Before we get to that, and I'm not even going to try to do this because I'll murder it, you have to at least go through your bio. Okay. Because you're kind of smart, and you've kind of <laughs> done some stuff, and uh, I think it's important for people to listen and who are listening to have a little bit of context it's about where the information's coming from. It's like from. a million monkeys at a typewriter. Every once in a while I get something right, <laughs> so it's more a statistical thing. This is how I got my wife, who was just statistical... If you throw enough darts at a dartboard, you will... You're going to get a bullseye occasionally. Occasionally. And that's where that yep. one came out. But, uh... So, like, bio-bio, a uh, uh, former research biochemist. Um, super early in the CrossFit scene, I actually co-founded the first and fourth CrossFit affiliate gyms. The first and fourth? First and fourth, yeah, yeah. How did you... So, where were you studying your 
the bio stuff, though? So I did my uh, biochemistry undergrad in Chico. Then I moved up to Seattle, which if you consider my health and wellness was a huge tactical error. If you consider like the rest <laughs> of my life, um, you know, like meeting Dave Warner and Nick Nibbler and getting yeah. involved with those guys in CrossFit, um, uh, kind of getting into this paleo diet concept. Like it was a good move in that regard because my health totally cratered and I had to figure out how to dig myself out of that hole. I've and never been there. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, where, where was your life going though? If, had you not found the CrossFit scene, if you were, were you going to dive deep into the, what did you think it was going to look like or what would it have looked like if you hadn't have found those people? Uh, probably heading into like an academic research position. Like I had, I had, uh, kicked the tires on medical school. And yeah. although I appear to be affable and like people, um, I'm similar to John Wellborn in that I lack a, a 23 and me, like no, no <laughs> shit. I lack the empathy gene. So, <laughs> and there, I mean, it's there like an actual gene. There's a, there are genes that, it, and I mean, this stuff is soft science. There, it, there are tendencies, but I'm like six standard deviations low. So like I see somebody in there, I'm like, what happened? My father died. And I look at them and they're, they're, clearly their world is imploding. I'm like, okay, that's sadness. And I should respond in this way. Like I literally like, even though I, I do enjoy helping people, it's kind of like, I like helping him from a distance and not necessarily. You could have been right. like the best surgeon in the world, though. I would have probably been a half decent surgeon. Well, yeah, yeah. Anesthetize the person, yeah. roll them in. You come in. I mean, I only know this because I watch ER, which is a documentary. <laughs> you do the you know robust scrubbing, and somebody puts your gloves on. You don't have to talk to him, and then you just cut them into pieces. I could actually. You'd be an amazing serial killer. Well, uh, in high school, I was voted most likely to be a cult leader, which Were when you, you really? consider paleo and crossfit and some of the other stuff i'm not it, seeing it's kind of manifest <laughs> destiny a little bit yeah. i bet you they don't let people vote for that category in high school anymore i i, I think that it was kind of a line item that they added in and and uh <laughs> but it may have actually been a a thing at that point so yeah my oldest son goes into high school holy smokes this next year i i can't believe it man i mean i think when we first met in the crossfit world he was running around at like maybe two feet tall yeah yeah, yeah. like he was as old as what my girls are yeah right now like he's four to six learning yeah. to drive wow he's yet to ask me he'll ask everybody but me he does <laughs> like my brother-in-law so you're telling me this kid's really smart <laughs> dude well i'm well Again, you've known me long enough that when my kids hit the age of eight, they surpass me with the mental horsepower. <laughs> uh, my middle son actually is shockingly smart. Like, so smart that I don't, well, I was going to say that I don't want to say he's socially awkward sometimes, but the reality is he's so smart that he's socially awkward sometimes. Right. And I will literally have conversations with this kid. He turns 13 next month. And two days later, I'd be like, son of a bitch. That's what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I digress. Okay, so you were going deep into the, I mean, that's an academic world for sure, right? So if you were doing research biochemistry stuff, you would have been probably white lab code. Right, right. The The main problem with that, so I, I figured out that I didn't really want to do the medicine thing. And part of it too was just having a little bit of prescience and looking down the road and it was paperwork and covering yeah. your ass. Like that was, you know, becoming a doctor and that didn't seem appealing to me. And although I liked lab work, um, I got in big trouble because I would take caution tape and then do like a chalk outline on the floor. And then OSHA came in one day and like we almost got <laughs> fined. And our, you know, the PI of our lab was like, dude, you can't do that. And I, I would do all these jokes. And so funny haha ha in the biochemistry analytical world aren't going to mix. Not so much. Yeah. Can yes. you imagine me in that environment? <laughs> oh, my God. I would add food coloring to samples. Like I would just be instantaneously fired. Yeah, it, so it was funny. Like, I didn't, it, and this is the funny thing, too. Like, I also am somewhat socially awkward. And so <laughs> I don't think you are. <laughs> well, you know, you call yeah. people like John Wellborn good friends. So, I mean, it, 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 yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if he doesn't have an empathy gene or he just cut it out and ate it. He may, that could be, yeah. yeah he cooked it on that massive uh, Texas grill in his backyard and just ate his empathy gene for right, dinner. Right, right. Appetizer. So, you were working in that world. How did you, how did you meet Dave Warner? Because I've actually met him um, from up north. How did you meet those guys and get uh, routed into the CrossFit world? So, so that's funny. So I was following Pavel Satsulin, the kettlebell guy. Yep. And this was er early. I mean, it was 2000, 2001. It was even before we had found CrossFit.com online. 
Well, didn't it launch in late? Two- it was February of 2001, yeah. So yeah. if you were in 2000, you couldn't have found it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so both Dave and I were on the Dragon Door message board that was following kind of the Pavel stuff. And one day, I, I there was a local YMCA that I would work out in. It was really good, but there was a guy doing curls in the squat rack. And so I went up to him like, hey, man, I could set you up over here at the curl station because I can't squat there, but you could curl both there and here. And like this thing escalated such that like, you know, it was almost, it did. yeah, of course, <laughs> you know. And so I, I went on the message board. I'm like, hey, um, I've got a bunch of dumbbells. Do you think I could get a decent workout only doing dumbbells and no barbell work? And Dave was like, hey, man, I know this sounds weird. You don't know me, but I probably live right up the street from you and you're welcome to come work out at my garage. And I'm like, yeah, go fuck yourself. Like That's, yeah, not that's an invitation no. to have your skin worn like a leotard. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, a serial incident similar to the curls in the squat rack made me decide, okay, if somebody wears my skin, that's fine. That's yeah. that's an improvement off of what's <laughs> happening with me trying to get a workout. So like Dave and I cleared out his old garage and like we started working out there. And then it was it was maybe like four months after that that we found CrossFit. And what was funny about that is like initially we really liked all the links. Like they had great links to different research topics and yeah. stuff. I'm like, dude, these workouts are ridiculous. Who would ever do that stuff? But then finally, oh, and, and the, the backstory with that is we told uh, Nick Nibbler, who was, ended up being a co-founder of CrossFit North initially, we told him about all this stuff. And then we didn't see Nick for like a month. And then he came back and like his neck was bigger and he was doing all this, you, you know, cr- crazy stuff. And we're like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, we were doing that CrossFit stuff, you know. And for people listening, like you're – you found it like right after they launched the I website mean, in their garage because February 2001, I mean, I remember you and I probably both heard Greg tell the story it was a blue background with white writing yes. and people yeah. would hit the print button and you can't print white text on white writing. So they're like, son of a bitch. This right. is the most secretive workout <laughs> program <laughs> right. ever. But yeah, it was like literally, I mean, that was to call it a binary site. I mean, it was, you know, yeah, yeah, it's uh Damn, man, that's early, early. It, and there were like three early iterations. There was that that kind of blue background, and then there was a, another one that was, uh, God, I, I, I forget, but it, each time they would update the site, everybody's account would disappear. Of course and, it would. You know, everything would crash, <laughs> and there was no, nothing there, but I kept like getting back in there. And yeah. then finally they hit, a, not quite the version that they still have, but, you know, one iteration earlier than that and things kind of stabilized. Which they had for a long time. It was like on a blog platform, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, 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 and that, that's kind of a funny thing. And a hat tip to those guys. Like, they were blogging before there was a term blogging, you know, and they yep. just kind of, so interesting. They stumbled into so many things and kind of like right place, right time, you know. you. you well, I remember the affiliate list on the right-hand side. You know, when I, I mean, I found it later in uh, 2005, but you could just one scroll. Right. And you were to the top, to the bottom of the affiliate list. Right. And before they switched over that template, you're just sitting there scrolling, going, scroll, going. scroll, scroll. Yeah, it was, I mean, I wonder how much of it was intentional versus accidental, just bouncing their head against the limits of what were possible on the internet at that time. I think it was massively accidental. <laughs> I think it was too, yeah. but I mean, there you go. Fortune favors the bold on that right, one. Right, <laughs> right. You know, it was funny. Uh, uh, so it was maybe, so CrossFit North was founded officially in 2003, and we were having a conversation with, with Greg Glassman, and he was like, so how big do you think this thing could get? And I, I did a little poking around, you know, like, well, how many Taekwondo schools are there? How many karate schools? And kind of did this stuff and I'm like by 2007 there's going to be 10,000 affiliate gyms and he's like no that's <laughs> madness you know I'm like no if you guys do this this and this the only thing I was wrong about was it took till 2010 and I think that some of that is because some of the best practices were not really like you, you know hey yeah you should have a business software system yeah. and you know on ramps and stuff some and of the best practices on the business side of the house were not as established as the best practices on the fitness or yes. exercise side yeah of the house. so it actually yeah. took a little longer to hit that like ten thousand mark but I, I was pretty 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 spot on with that really when you think about it yeah that, that's actually a good uh that's a good measurement is looking at all the other schools that are similarly yeah. structured that makes sense to me for yeah. sure so you're early in there Looking at the blue and white, which I wish I could find a screen grab of that and post it somewhere to show people. I think that was even before the Wayback Machine. Like, that thing didn't even <laughs> exist at that point. <laughs> I so, yeah. think it did. 
Um, so you started doing it. Or mm-hmm. What was your first uh, experience or exposure? Uh, you know, the funny thing, so I was a power lifter by, by background. Oh, I know. I've and, seen you lift many heavy things. And uh, uh, so anything that had running <laughs> it, and I'm like, pass, <laughs> pass, <laughs> pass. So it was all the, you know, the shorter stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, uh, they never had squats in the workouts, interestingly, when I, when I think back about that. But the deadlifting and power cleans, like I had a decent background in that stuff and started doing it. And it was kind of weird. Like I had this six to nine month window where, and I wasn't a spring chicken at this point. I was heading towards 30 years old. Maybe I was 31 or whatever. I got my first standing backflip. I power cleaned and push jerked like 320 pounds or something at a a buck 70, buck 75. There was this window where like everything just exploded. Like I made progress like you couldn't believe. And it was interesting because my usual powerlifting workouts would be like two, two and a half hours. They were long, they were grinding. Now, granted, I was usually training four to six days a week doing the CrossFit stuff, but it was quick. You know, you'd warm up, do some mobility work, get your main workout done. So it was really incredible. But then after about that six to nine month window, I started declining. And then I, it was probably a three-year period of just adding volume and intensity, trying to get back to that. And then I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So I had basically like a novice effect <laughs> doing this new style of training. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was, I was slow to learn that lesson. And yeah, yeah I had yeah. the, I think anybody who comes to that type of methodology from re- regardless of what you were doing before, you're going to have that accelerated trajectory. Right. I had it. The first time I ever logged onto the site was from a recommendation of a buddy. I was trying to rehab from getting hurt at work. And the workout of the day was deadlift 11111. And I remember saying out loud, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> right. And didn't log back on for like three, because I had no understanding. I had to have it explained to me what right. it was. And I'm like, that, this is dumb. I don't. First off, I've never done a deadlift. Right. Obviously, I've picked things up off the ground, but I didn't call it that. I just called it picking things up off the ground. And then when I found it, it actually, I mean, obviously it changed the trajectory of what I think about exercise because I've done, I've done curls in a squat rack. Right. Don't hate me. <laughs> For eight years, I just did back and buys and chest and tries and my leg day was running on the beach. Right. And, uh, you know, rinse, wash, repeat. And then I found that methodology and was like, oh, okay, now I'm actually lighter and more competent and capable in right. my body armor. So. It had an impact for sure. And then you affiliated yourself. Yep. Yeah. So yep. you dove in. How long did you have your gym? So we started off as CrossFit NorCal. Then we kind of dual branded NorCal Strength and Conditioning. It was founded January 24th, 2004. And the gym is still running. Yep. Um, we were fully out. My wife and I, 2010, I think, we, we sold it to my brother and sister-in-law and you know, the, the funny thing with that is my brother-in-law in particular, he had the skill set of both the front end and the back end that my wife and I had. Like he could shake hands, kiss babies, good programmer, but he also had an amazing eye for the, the business systems. So he really took it from an okay spot business-wise to an and then just blew business. it up. Yeah, he really did a phenomenal job with that. But That's got to be the hardest thing for people. I mean, so I owned a gym too, mm-hmm. you know, and it's with zero business background, obviously had been been peripheral to business and working for my dad, who was a, uh, you know, a, a business owner himself. But that's if there was a weak link in my game, it was absolutely that. Right. Like, what's the best practice for this? You know what? I don't care. I'm not. I'm going to ignore that, and we're just going to do thrusters until somebody throws <laughs> right. up. That's got to be still. I would bet to this day the toughest thing because I think we'd all agree the methodology works, but mm-hmm. turning the methodology into a, something that can pay your mortgage. That's like standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon and trying to broad jump it It, if you don't know what you're doing. It's a big deal. And, you know, we reached a point where uh, we had both salaried employees, but with incentives. Like, I'm really not into, like, creating a socialized environment where the incentives are misaligned and people are just kind of living off the teat. So we we put together some... Quality of outcome. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, that's a... (laughs) <laughs> That'll work out well for everybody, yeah. Um, and, you know, we had 401ks. We had health insurance for our, our employees. So we reached a point that I would say probably fewer than 1% of all CrossFit gyms that have ever existed. I'd say even less than that. Yeah, like possibly point, less than that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I can think of maybe one other gym that even has talked about 401k or that level of longevity when you're talking about taking care of your employees. Right, right. Most, yeah, most but, of them are in industrial spaces with people who are passionate right trying to bridge passion and profession it's it's tough yeah it, it it's a 
when we look back, we put as much work into that as people would put into a tech startup. So my wife was a co-founder of a tech startup after we got out of the gym and it was a massive amount of work for her, but we looked back and we're like, oh my God, it's equal starting a gym to, you know, like starting like a technology startup or, or something else. And although like, I really loved running the gym, but if you, if you love it and, and love the, the, uh, the pacing and all that, it's great. And you, if you run it well, you can probably get a a low six figure income out of that. Mm -hmm. But there's for most people about a four to six year run before they are burned out and cooked. And that's even if you're doing things well. And then if you're doing things poorly and you're like yeah. taking a HELOC on your, your mortgage <laughs> to keep the gym open and then you lose the house and then you lose the gym. We saw a lot of people do that because I was they say, unfortunately, I know a few people have had that happen as well too. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, uh, it's also a, get a, uh, get a associates in being a therapist because if you're going to train people, it's about 80% therapy, 20% training. Right. And meaning you don't have to want to be their therapist. You're going to be you're their therapist. You're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're going to have an empty gym. Yeah. yeah. And then 20% of the time you'll actually talk about movement. Right. I would say that's one of the main reasons I moved away from it. Yeah. Like, listen, people, I have my own goddamn problems. <laughs> right. And I'm, I want you to have a happy and fulfilling life. But I'm struggling. But somebody to else out, is going to facilitate yeah. that. Yeah. I'm struggling to figure out my own goddamn problems. So go in the corner and do thrusters, <laughs> facing the wall. Facing the wall. <laughs> Man, yeah, what an interesting time. Um, so when did you? I mean, I think most people, if they, if they've heard your name, it's going to be in associated with the, the paleo, right? Mm-hmm. Or the the dietary aspect when did you dive deep into that because we you know biochem researcher the affiliate gym and but you're also i would basically call you yoda when it comes to the <laughs> paleo world well short green and old that that, that kind of ticks most of the boxes you have yeah. the green riding on your shirt right now <laughs> <laughs> um so so i was super sick around 2006 or, or 1996 1997 and I had ulcerative colitis so bad that they wanted to do a bowel resection on me. None had, of that. I don't know any of those words, but none of that sounds awesome. It was bad. Okay. It was bad. And, and I mean, the prospect for somebody as young as I was at that time having this, if you made it to 35, you were kind of lucky. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, it, it's a really pretty gnarly set of circumstances. I'm about 170 pounds right now. I was 130 pounds at that time just malabsorption. Like I literally, I would eat food and it would come out the same way that it went in. I was eating a vegan diet at the time. And now vegan diet can work for a lot of people. But for me, looking back, like I'm really just generally carb intolerant. Like I did some, some genetic testing and it's like, yeah, look at carbs, but don't eat them basically was what the genetic testing said. And then I'm really, really reactive to wheat and gluten and oats and all that stuff, which was... Which genetic testing did you do? If people are curious about it, what would you recommend to get that info? A couple of different routes. So I did 23andMe and then the 23andMe data can be exported to different outfits. And uh, it was dnafit.com, which was the one that gave me kind of a deeper dive on, on... um, what type of workouts would be more appropriate for me? Am I fast twitch or slow twitch? Uh, am I carb tolerant or intolerant? Can I? It, it, would a ketogenic diet be a good fit for me based off some some fat mobilizing genes and stuff like that? And interestingly, like through experimentation, I've kind of arrived at this kind of peri keto, you know, low carb kind of thing. And I have outstanding genetics for fat mobilization, fat hmm. metabolism. Uh, the the one thing that is a little bit of, of a problem is that I should probably have more monounsaturated fats and saturated fats. So I shouldn't be the guy doing like buttered coffee all day long. And, and when I've done that, my uh, cholesterol and lipoproteins get really high. But then if I stick more with nuts and, and olive oil, it just plummets. Comes back down. Yeah, it comes back down. So for that 23andMe and the DNAFit.com, did you, do they send you a kit? Did you have to go to a doc? Like what's required? What's the buy-in for that? For Either of these, you have to do the initial testing, and it's usually a mouth swab okay. when you send it in. And so you could get that testing through DNA Fit, um, but again, kind of an easy way to do it is 23andMe. Their API is so robust that anybody else that pops up, they always integrate with it. So that could be kind of the place that you get the initial screen, and then if you want to put it through Prometheus, which does like a full retard you know, deep dive on stuff, but it doesn't provide any real interpretation. Like hmm. you've got to then get in and, and look at, 
you know, the references that they provide and everything, but it provides a massive amount of information or like, uh, by that you mean I should do this and send it to you and get it in layman's terms. I'm not even like, <laughs> I am not, I am actually not the person to look at that. Like, uh, Rhonda Patrick, uh, there's a guy out of Texas. Um, oh man, I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, it, it'll come to me later, but he does an amazing job of like putting together all that Prometheus information and then giving you something actionable. Like they, they figured, he figured out that, uh, uh, I, because of my genetics, I probably have both some nitrogen clearance issues and also some sulfur clearance issues, which Mm. I I don't eat a low protein diet, but I don't eat a super high protein diet either. It's kind of modest in, in level. And it's interesting. I definitely feel better. And part of that is like your liver and just your system gets bogged down if you don't clear nitrogen yeah, this sense. is you, you know when people are doing super long endurance races nitrogen buildup is one of the things that can ultimately really negatively impact their performance because they're just getting out mm. they're doing so much output that they get ahead of what their liver can can process and so this was some of the the uh kind of really nuanced like final two percent of you know kind of performance or health gains that you could get by having someone really knowledgeable get in and look at that stuff yeah, you know what? It, it's uh, let's add to this. If your diet is Doritos and pizza, you've got a, it, it's all it's all upside. Yeah, it's all upside from what there. I, <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that the DNA uh, fit in the 23andMe might be awesome, but you have some other large building blocks to move first. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Like you said, we're at the upper end of the spectrum. <laughs> all right. So I derailed you. So you were super sick. Yeah, and it, so. My mom had always been sick also, and she was sick with stuff that looked similar to mine, like a little bit, I don't know if you can tell the difference, but the knuckles on this hand are a little bit larger than the other one. I had what we suspect is some undiagnosed rheumatoid arthritis. My mom was sick for ages, and it was right around this time she went in the hospital, almost died, and she had inflammation around the heart and lungs so bad that, you know, it almost shut down their function. So they put her on uh, anti immunosuppressant drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, managed to pull her back. And her rheumatologist figured out that she was reactive to grains, legumes, and dairy. And that she had this just uh, interconnected like seven or eight different autoimmune conditions, which when you look at them, they're virtually identical. They just kind of affect different different yeah. tissues and organs and whatnot. But she's relating all this stuff to me. And it's like, yeah, it's really gut related. I have celiac disease, which is this gluten, you know, autoimmune condition and I'm reactive to grains, legumes, and dairy. So at this time I'm, I'm eating a vegan diet because I'm, I, I like to experiment and like ever it, it was all the Vogue. And I got to say all the vegan girls in college were pretty hot generally. So it was, it's a motivating it was, factor. It's a motivating factor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, vegan and vegetarian. What's the difference? Vegetarian is a super broad term. And I mean, it, it's kind of a self labeled thing. Like it, it could, Usually there's a couple of different flavors of it. Maybe you eat eggs, maybe you eat fish, some people eat chicken, and then when you get to vegan- The animals that don't have a soul. It, the animals that don't have a face and a soul, yeah, <laughs> largely, yeah, yeah. And then with vegan, it's no None animal of that products. Crap, right? And I mean, it can it can go to the point where you don't even use honey because the bees are mistreated in the collection of the honey. And it, 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 uh, it ticks all the boxes of a religion and a cult. And, uh, and it, it's really interesting because it, it's a very compelling worldview, you know, that I, I would argue that kind of conventional animal husbandry is kind of a nasty, unsustainable, you know, agree. proposition. So they've got a really strong argument there. Um, you can kind of, until you look at all the animals that are killed in the process. I love listening yeah. to Joe just crush people. Yeah. When it comes yeah. Up. When you look at row crops and yes. the number of animals that are killed in that, you know yeah. I mean? So but but at a very surface soundbite level, it's a super great. compelling argument. Yeah, yeah, and it's um. So that's where you were when you were feeling. That's like where this. I was. Okay, and, and more for exploring health reasons, because again, both my parents had been sick, and yeah. I, I didn't want to. I had this sneaky suspicion that not drinking a six pack of beer at night and smoking a pack of cigarettes a day would probably benefit me not heading down that road, you know, and maybe lifting some weights and yep. eating some good food. Yep. But for me, the, uh, you know, my mom had this clear reactivity to grains, legumes, and dairy. And it, although I was vegan, I wasn't eating dairy, but I mean, I was kind of like, you don't eat grains and legumes. Like, what the fuck do you eat? You're like, what is there? And it was literally this kind of wacky, like, like, you know, flow of consciousness. I'm like, okay, grains, legumes, and dairy. That's like, agriculture. Okay. What'd you eat before agriculture? Hunter gatherer, 
what do you call a hunter gatherer diet? And again, this is like 1998, but mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, I'd heard this term paleolithic diet. So I went into the house. Do you know where that term originated? Um, it's largely, it, it's a really good question because people will say that somebody kind of cooked it up, but this yeah. is the term that was applied by medical anthropologists and researchers studying both both uh, huh. uh, contemporarily living hunter-gatherers and then also our hunter-gatherer, you know, the remains of hunter-gatherer yep. ancestors. So they're able to kind of piece together in, in a variety of ways, like looking at the, the isotopes in the bones of hunter-gatherers. You can, and it's not perfect by any means, but you can kind of extrapolate, okay, how much of their protein came from land animals versus ocean animals versus freshwater animals and how much came from this type of plant versus that type of plant. And so you can piece some of this stuff together. And what, what it, it, one of the things that pops up is like, you really don't see the footprint of much in the way of grains and legumes in, in that hunter gatherer kind of existence. They and probably then, had no understanding of it at that point. Yeah. I mean, generally it was a, it was a pretty easy way to live comparatively. Yeah. Like it was about three to four hours Whatever, a day. Dude, of they work didn't have Instagram. <laughs> I mean, that takes a lot of time. <laughs> I, 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 I have to spin that dial. Oh my God. <laughs> Just got to strip mine the system and <laughs> before it all implodes, but that's a, that's a whole other aside. That's a different podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But it, so this idea of a paleo diet, you know, popped into my head, went in, turned on the computer, waited for the dial up to boot up. Yep. 1998, there's this new search engine called Google. Into Google, I put the term paleolithic diet and there wasn't a ton there yet, but one of my mentors, Lauren Cordain, um, he had some papers talking about how grains in particular could cause all kinds of GI problems. And he had a hypothesis how permeable gut or leaky gut could be an underpinning of autoimmune disease. So I was like, huh, okay, this is interesting. And so... Is that literally what it sounds like? Your gut is leaking out yes. into your body? Yeah, and you want to keep your poo where it belongs. Yeah, yeah. And you can get behind that. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a good bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't jumped on that one yet, but it, it's got to keep your poo where it belongs. I'll and make it for you. I'll send you a couple hundred. Okay. It's no big deal. Okay. okay. Just go to the grocery store and just put them on people's cars. That's fine. That's what I used to do. I, I have a feeling I would get shot or beat up doing that. but um, Obviously at nighttime okay. when they okay. can't see you. Good call. Yeah. Good call. But, um, you know, I, I just got in and gave that paleo type concept a shot. And it was uh, meats, seafood, fruits, vegetables, root shoots, tubers. And literally, like, it, this month is 20 years of, of doing that. And yeah, you I, haven't looked back since you started that, have you? You know, I've tinkered with deviating off a little bit here and there. You know, I'll be a little higher carb. I'll try some corn and rice and stuff like that. I can have a little corn, a little rice. Wheat is a non-starter. And the only thing that I miss out of my previous life is beer. And, you know, like... Corona and Budweiser and stuff like that are not beer. Like beer needs to be something you can't see light through. <laughs> it, it could sustain your life for months due to its... its Sounds to me like you're talking about Guinness, which yes. is my favorite beer. Yeah. I'll drink it for you. Uh, I thank yeah. you. Because yeah. I know what will happen to you if you drink it, and I don't want to be there for that. So You don't want me near your bathroom because <laughs> yeah. you'll have to brick it over, have an exorcism, <laughs> and a priest uh, deal with that bathroom. So, yeah. So after... So you go to the... Uh, the internet. You probably were logging on to AOL, um, <laughs> Pretty much. you know, and watching the little man hop from the each one of those little three boxes. Uh, how long after you started that, started eating like that, did you start noticing a difference in yourself? Oh, I mean, it was literally immediate. I mean, days later, I, I felt better because I wasn't sleeping. I was sleeping maybe like two hours a night, wow, and, and just trying to sleep, and you know, melatonin yeah. and this and that. Wasn't sleeping. Um, I was not keeping my poo where it belonged. Like it was like I had a case of like food poisoning, but it had been going on for three years. Um, I mean, all of that stuff started resolving almost immediately. I started putting muscle mass back on, felt better. I'd been suffering from really pretty crushing depression. I mean, like yeah. every moment of every day, it was kind of like, oh, I'm afraid of dying, but I can't wait to die because then I won't be well, thinking about dying. Well, you're in pain all the time, yeah. you know, and miserable. I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, you were, I'm sure, again, the knowledge level between the sides of this desk is vast, um, but there's all, people come in all shapes and forms and types. So it sounds like you were genetically predisposed to just be crushed by the diet you were on previously. Yeah. Whereas somebody else might tolerate it a little bit better, but they're still going to get the long-term benefit by changing out of that. For you, it might have been a difference of life and death, though, it sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely. And, you know, had I moved to Arizona or 
Puerto Rico instead of Seattle, and I had sun and warmth and vitamin D, I might have been able to manage that better. Huh. So like this is another funny thing, even though I'm, I'm like super Northern European, like the closer to the equator I get, the happier I am. I've, digestion is better, health is better. You notice a difference in your digestion the clo closer you are to the equator? Uh, it, like we go on vacation and some of it could just be vacation because I'm not working. But I mean, it's awesome. Because <laughs> I'm like, so why am I not doing this all the time, yeah. you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it. so when I go on vacation, I can have way more deviation in my diet and feel good and not have kind of like foggy headed, you know, kind of yep. blood sugar swings and all that. And that, that sun and light and circadian rhythm piece, I, I don't know if it's as important as diet, but it's number two for sure. And this is some of the stuff that, uh, you know, I got pulled in working with some of the team guys because of the night deployment or, you know, the night Vampire ops. Vampire schedule and the, is what we call it. Yeah. And guys would pre-deployment, they had great blood lipids, they had good testosterone and all that stuff. And they would come back and they look like a 90 year old man, yep. you know. On and the it, inside specifically. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and uh, you know, f trying to figure out what was going on with that, the circadian disruption was, was massive. And there are strategies for mitigating that, but there's just kind of a reality that police, fire, yep. military, new parents, like there's mitigating strategies, but it, th you're never quite as good as what you would be if you were on like a normal day shift. Yeah, you have to, you have to work your way through the wall and do the best that you can yeah. because that's, that's what you do. Yeah. Do you still work with uh, Spec War at all? Not specifically with the NSW Resilience Program. Like, they kind of wound that down. That's what I, yeah. I was thinking coming over here. I think this last time we saw each other was 2010 in, what was it, Disneyland? Yeah. Disney yeah. World or something yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah. At the post-deployment uh, retreat. I remember yep. you were talking about nutrition. And then, so yeah. they, they wound that down. They kind of wound it down. And my understanding, I could be wrong on this, but my, my understanding is that there was a, a change in the command structure, which yep. tends to happen. Often. And it, often. Yep. And of course, when a new person comes in, all the old stuff is ridiculous. And so that kind of gets, you know, wiped clean. And uh, I think the guy also really didn't like CrossFit. And paleo kind of tags along with CrossFit. Yep. And so there was just kind of some house cleaning on that. Every once in a while, I'll get uh, pulled in to do something. But I mean, it, uh, there was probably a six-year period where it was like two, three times a month I was going out doing those. And it was amazing because I got to work both with the, the team guys, but also usually a day with the guys and then a day with the family and yep. you know the spouse and the kids, which was... I don't know that I would say more important, but it was equally as important. I would say it's more important. Yeah, p potentially, because it, it's... Um, they have to manage... You know, I'm still trying to get Jamie to do an episode with me, and she's she's resistant because... Well, I don't want to speak for her, but what I've heard her say is that she's she's resistant because her experience with the military and being a spouse and... She's a, as much in the military as I was. You right. Know, going through the mechanism, she didn't enjoy it. She right. doesn't have a lot of good things to say, and... I keep telling her, that's okay. That's as valuable as... I get hit up yeah. from spouses who... I just, like, I try to be extremely honest about my experiences. This is what happened. It wasn't all great. Some secondary, tertiary, and long-term consequences to the relationship with my wife, with my kids, the time away, the stress, inability to work through complex issues so you shelve it. Because right. that makes it go away, right? If you just <laughs> ignore it, it never comes back. Usually, uh... A lot of Guinness will help oh, that. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, that's when the interesting conversations start. But that piece of the it, the easiest role to play in a military family is the military member because mm -hmm. you are just on the rails, choo choo, trains down the track, and they're just shoving coal in the engine. Right. Um, I didn't realize how hard it was for her until I got out. I was like, God damn. So I would say that the family piece and supporting the fa that's even more important, I think, than the service member because the service member is going to be okay. He's going to go to work and be out, hang out with, right. his, with his boys. <laughs> Or his girls, depending on what environment they're coming from. But that sucks to hear, man. It's um, the word CrossFit, and you know this as well as I do, is so polarizing. Right. You either are on board or fuck that noise because you had a bad experience or you associate it. It's a na it, it's a pejorative almost in certain right. circles, which is unfortunate because the methodology I do believe truly works. And that community piece, it, it's a it, it it is completely lacking in the rest of our culture. Like it, yeah. it, you get it maybe from like jujitsu or something, but even not to which the same I, degree. Which is, I think is part of the draw, mm -hmm. and that's when people are like, oh, it's a cult. I'm like, well, okay. But at least they're sweating and doing awesome right, stuff in right. that cult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like I've never, 
I've never, so when we, our gym was still pretty early, but the financial crash occurred and Chico was waylaid by the Just financial, devastated, yeah. Just devastated. And I learned a lot by that because I saw people living way beyond their means and you know, they're telling me about $20,000 wine country weekends. And I'm a little bit of an econ nerd. And I'm like, hey, have you ever heard of bubbles? And like thought about yeah. a rainy day. And they're like, oh, this is going to go on forever. You know, and I saw these people like they, they ended up starting to lose everything just when the rate of growth slowed. Like they needed escape velocity yeah. and not just like a plane a attaining altitude, you know, and then they started losing everything. That's how leveraged they were. And so like I've always structured my life where I could go collect cans yeah. and I could float our baseline level of survival, you know, and... Uh, I might be able to do that too, but I'd need a couple of days to get the cans. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying it would be a full-time deal, but I, I could collect cans full-time. And, and right, yeah, yeah and it, so I learned a ton from that. But one of the fascinating things that I saw in our CrossFit gym, it, people open up their house to other members, like yes. if they lost their house. They figured out work for them. Sometimes it wasn't the best work, but it was some kind of work. Support networks were crazy. Yeah. Cooking meal, you know, uh, even like a family illness or an emergency right. cooking meal. It was, it was, and it was all based around that origin of exercise. Right. The and I was having a conversation uh, yesterday. You know, people are talking. Well, what's camaraderie? It's well, it's shared suffering and laughter. Right. Which is basically what happens in a good gym for your hour long class. You're gonna be. With other people, you're going to laugh about some stuff. The workout's probably going to suck. It, and at some point, you're going to say, why did I come here? I could have yeah. been golfing. Yeah. I hate this. <laughs> all right, I'll keep going. And then, yeah, you have those bonds, but it's all based around that origin. And, uh, man, I wish people, more people had something like that. Because right. I agree, it's it's hard to find that community or tribe is the soup de jour of the day right. term for that. But I, I agree with you, man. It was, it was really cool owning that affiliate. I I literally just tapped out on available hard drive space right. of things that I could do and had to back away. Well, if you're going to run a gym, it's got to be your full-time gig. Yep. It has to be in so many people, particularly uh, police and fire, because they had kind of a stable side gig and they had kind of a variable schedule. They're like, oh, I can get in and do this, but it, it's... um. In my opinion, it's a horrible idea. Like join somebody else's gym or just yeah. have a garage gym or you do a key in deal where like you and five other people allocate some resources and, and, but, uh, man, don't take on the responsibilities of a commercial business unless you're going, like, it is your singular thing yep. that you do because I don't care how smart or talented you are. It, you won't do the diligence in it to make it successful. And, and well, you what, won't enjoy it as much either. Your you enjoyment, won't enjoy it. you'll come yeah. right over the top of the bell curve on the enjoyment scale rapidly. Yeah. It, you'll come, uh, you'll climb. You'll grow to hate it. Oh, you'll climb at the beginning. Yeah. This is awesome. And then you're going to get, you're going to get a long shift or an overtime call. You're going to skip a night's sleep. You're going to have to teach the 6 a.m. class. One of your popular trainers <laughs> is going to split yep. and 50 of your clients go with them. Yep. And yeah. Being yeah. a member is way better than being an oh owner. I think yeah. 90, I'm a, I would say 100% of the time, but I hate uh, absolutes, like always and never, and 100% and zero scare the crap out of me. So 99.9% .9 of the time. I, 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 <laughs> I would sign off on that, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right, so I have some questions for you in, maybe not necessarily paleo-related, because I sit back and I just, uh, how would I describe the information coming at people? Shotgun blast to the face. Yeah. <laughs> water, I mean, what a fire hose. En en enema with hot lead. Yeah. Oh God. I mean, it's, so it's overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but recently, and I've actually been playing around with this a little bit. So this one, well, again, pretend that I'm asking for somebody else. Pretend that it's not me asking this. It's a really smart person who needs to know. Uh, but one of the ones I'm hearing a lot recently: intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. um, have you played around with that at all? I have, and you know, uh, I wrote the first article on this that got published in the performance menu in 2005. Okay. And so I've been following this stuff for a long time. And the, the initial thought around intermittent fasting, the animal models, it suggested that if you did it right, you would get both uh, these really interesting health and longevity benefits. But if it was, if the fasting wasn't too long, then you also got kind of this enhanced anabolic and metabolic state. The problem with this stuff is that uh, they would intermittent fast mice, like they would eat one day, not eat one day. Not eating a day for a mouse is equivalent to a human not eating like seven to ten days. 
So there was some really big stuff kind of lost in translation yeah. with that. Is that common to uh, use mice and then overlay the hypothetical results to humans? Yes, and and it, it's just because they don't talk about that aspect it, very much. It's so fraught with problems. Like it can. It, I've reached a point where um, I wouldn't say I won't read non-human studies at this point, but it's reached a point where it's all so theoretical that it, it's kind of like, well, it brass tacks. Like, what am I going to take away? And the only way I can have a solid takeaway is really kind of a human trial. It, yeah. And yeah, so I've Unless almost, your jam is mice. And then, unless your jam is mice, then yeah. 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 And again, like you can get some kind of ideas around this stuff, but, um, and this gets really out in the weeds, but it, so it, initially I wrote a couple articles for the performance menu. Um, it, it was intermittent fasting became pretty popular within the CrossFit scene. And what I saw was that for a few people, it really benefited them. And then for the, the, there was a group of people that were crossfitting six days a week. They would recover by doing hot yoga and a hike. They ate five grams of carbohydrate a month, and then they would intermittent fast for 20 hours a day. And the first- it Sounds like a lot. It's a lot, but it, like the people who do it, they're these people. They're not like the, the, you know, the type B computer programmer that's mellow. You know, when, when he or she is driving in traffic, they're like, oh, no, no, come on, yeah. move in. I've got room for it. It's not that person, you know. And what you would see is maybe a first couple of weeks, people felt really good because they're in this a gnarly fight or flight response. And then their whole system tanks and they're like, my hair's falling out. My thyroid's done. I haven't had a boner or a desire to sleep with someone in two years, you know, and it, and it just absolutely cratered them. So I found intermittent fasting to be, a, a, compared to simply not overeating, which even saying that is kind of a loaded deal. Like in our modern processed food environment, yeah. you actually have to, you have to have some strategies to not overeat. But when you, when you look at someone who's just generally not overeating, and you look at the likelihood of them developing like the major causes of morbidity and mortality, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. If you just don't overeat, your likelihood of developing any of these things is dramatically less. And then if you look at the pain and suffering and potential problems associated with intermittent fasting versus the potential upside, there's just not that much upside. Now that, that said, I think like eating an early breakfast and then trying to wrap up your dinner early. So like, you know, nine, eight or 9 a.m. breakfast and then a four or 5 p.m. dinner, or mm -hmm. maybe even a little tighter. There might be some arguments for doing that. A um, little bit of time restricted feeding, but the, it's really, really unlikely. Like the, the, there's a great paper that looks at caloric restriction in humans and other animals. And if you were to caloric restrict yourself at 40% below what you would normally eat, you're going to be super skinny, weak, no muscle mass, no libido, cold. You have to do that your whole life, and you might get six to eight years of additional life out of that. Or but if, you're dealing with all that other stuff. But you're dealing with all that other stuff throughout the totality <laughs> you limit, yeah. of your life. And it, because humans have this... this uh, it's called genetic reaction norm. This gets out in the weeds a little bit, but it's basically like when you look at the, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but when you look at the energy input for humans raising their offspring compared to certain types of animals, our energy input is relatively low, which is sounds ridiculous to say, but in it, it's most strains of mice, but not all strains of mice, if you calorie restrict them, they live longer, but not all animals live longer due to calorie restriction. And now they're finally realizing the calorie restriction in lab animals may simply be protecting them from the super shitty lab food. They did some recent studies where they fed these animals their ancestral diet, like a biologically appropriate diet. Caloric restriction killed them at, at a higher rate. <laughs> and then the ones that were fed a, a, a biologically appropriate diet and they were living in an environment where they weren't being predated, they lived as long as the caloric restricted animals. So this is kind of this this kind of back channel way of you know kind of shining possibly a favorable light on eating something that looks a little bit like a paleo diet you know yeah. eat something that's a little bit species specific lift some weights get some sun on your skin maybe do a little bit of mild intermittent fasting but it, it's unlikely that really uh serious uh bouts of intermittent fasting 
is really going to benefit you a whole lot. The, the one thing that I'll say is it, it shines a light on, it's probably unnecessary to do six meals a day of, of eating and probably neurotic and maybe even problematic. Yeah. So The classic small meals yeah, frequently. Yeah. yeah, and there are some people that that's a, a, an appropriate thing. Like there's, a, you know, to your point, you know, there's the, the always Size and nevers are, yeah. Are, yeah. Are, are, are dodgy, but um, two maybe three meals a day, two meals and a snack, probably good to go, which, you know, doesn't sound all that, all that crazy. Um, there's maybe an argument, you know, once or twice a year to do a three to five day fast to stimulate some, some apoptosis, some, some cell death of, of, uh, uh, cells that are becoming what they call senescent where they're alive, but they're not really doing what they should do. Um, but that's kind of like it. And it, it's, uh, Again, if you just overlay not overeating mm. and some reasonable exercise, going to bed at an appropriate hour and stuff like that, like you're really hard pressed to find, like if I were to add something to that, it would be sauna. Like when you just look at like a return on investment, um, I would probably lean towards try to find a species specific diet, try to get about as much muscle mass on your person as you can, um, and then uh, and then do a sauna. And like from a return on investment standpoint, that is, I, I'm really like from there, it really starts dropping off rapidly, you know, other yeah. than having community and, you know, yep. m meaning in your life and all those types of things. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It's funny. You know, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, you know, with the intermittent fasting, because I hear it a ton, I was going to ask you, can you take it too far? And Absolutely. Think, yeah. And I think you address that. And, you know, talking about the shotgun or the volume of information coming at people, what I have heard recently is, uh, I guess, and maybe it's not new, but one buzzword is definitely ketosis, mm -hmm. right? Ketogenic diet. And then I'm hearing people overlay that to the intermittent fasting as if one leads you to the other one. Right. Um, you know, saying that the ketogenic diet, or and I'm sorry, uh, not the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting will keep you in ketosis, mm -hmm. which is part of the ketogenic diet. Can you, at a uh, kindergarten level, explain to me, so A, ketosis and the ketogenic diet, just... Sure. You, you know, and fasting is actually a good way to jump into it. it. When we cease eating calories and carbohydrates in particular, our body is going to start mobilizing stored energy to, to use to, to keep us going. We'll get a little bit of glucose, some sugar out of our liver, and then we start burning body fat. And if we burn body fat at a really high rate without some carbohydrate, mainly as kind of a backbone to, to pump it through our metabolic machinery, then we tend to start producing ketone bodies. These uh, uh, There's a couple of different varieties of them, but in general, the brain runs off glucose, but in a fasted state, the brain will run off a little bit of glucose, but then it will shift maybe 70, 80% of its energy needs to these ketone bodies. It, it basically takes fat, which isn't water soluble and creates these ketone bodies, which are water soluble. And so they can go through the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. and it keeps the brain happy. Um, ketosis kind of got on folks radar ages ago, it, it, over a hundred years ago, it was used as a intervention for, uh, epilepsy because we, we really? just didn't have drugs to address epileptic seizures. And they noticed that if, or when people fasted, their epileptic seizures would either get way better or just go completely in remission, but you can't fast forever. Well, you so, can, but there's you a, can, but there is the a, window of opportunity rapidly comes it, to an end. It, it's kind of like the, it's not the fall, <laughs> but the rapid deceleration. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's uh, so, but the you know this was uh, early 1900s. We were starting to understand biochemistry and metabolism in a way that they they understood what was happening in the physiology of fasting. So they put together a diet that would mimic fasting, which was moderate to low protein, very low carb, high fat. And they gave this to folks, and, and this is kind of the classic four-to-one yep. ratio epilepsy, ep epilepsy type uh, uh, ketogenic diet. In the back, so that's kind of one avenue of this. Also in the background, uh, in mainstream medicine prior to the 1950s, if somebody was overweight, what they recommended for them to lose weight was a low-carb diet. They're like, cut out bread, cut out potatoes cut out desserts. And there's not anything specifically magic about the state other than a higher protein, typically higher fat diet tends to be very satiating. You eat it, you're, you're, you, you feel full, you're, you're good to go. Um, you you uh, tend to not be on this kind of carbohydrate roller coaster that, yeah. that many people can find themselves on. 
And so we had kind of two parallel tracks where the ketogenic diet was being used for some neurological conditions. And then also it was kind of standard of practice, standard of care, that if people were overweight, they would use a, a low carb diet to, to lose weight. Um, most people are familiar with the Atkins diet. Atkins learned about a low carb diet from a, a US Air Force guide for overweight pilots. So if the Seriously? pilots were too heavy to, to be <laughs> flight ready to have yeah. flight status, the, the, the army manual recommended a low carb diet. It was like, have these foods, don't have these foods. And, and, wow. and it worked, it worked great. You know, it worked for virtually everybody. And so Atkins, he didn't just, this is some kind of funny background when people hear that, like their incredulity about the Atkins approach are kind of like, wait a second. So the army was recommending this for like 30 <laughs> years to, to fat pilots. And it's like, yeah, that's what, that's what they would do. And, uh, so that's kind of the ketogenic diet. It, 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 uh, Big picture level, um, people use it for cognitive enhancement. Like some people notice they just feel really on, very alert. They don't have energy swings mm -hmm. because their brain isn't tied to these blood glucose ups and downs. Like the ketone bodies are very, very consistent. Other people notice that they get some performance enhancement uh, physiologically. I would say mainly endurance type athletes. So I was going to ask yeah. you that, you know, because... Uh you already said endurance athletes. I, I'll put that on one end of the spectrum. And then you have the hardcore uh, CrossFit Games athlete. Two different types of energy expenditure. I, I would actually put those people, uh, the CrossFit gamers, a little bit in the middle. And okay. then like a power lifter or Olympic lifter at that uh, extreme opposite For sure. from the, the, the endurance athlete. And the interesting thing is if you think about metabolic pathways and also if you just kind of anecdotally look on online, mm -hmm. which, you know, lots of truth floating around there. Dangerous thing to do, but, but have fun, wear but, a life jacket. Exactly. But you see people succeeding at these very short time indexes of Olympic lifting, power lifting, maybe even a little bit of bodybuilding. And you see people succeeding at these really, uh, you know, three day, 100 mile, 150 mile, you know, races. But this middle ground of MMA, CrossFit, soccer, you see a lot of people that have blown up. And yep. it, it's very difficult, in my opinion, to fuel uh, glycolytic activity, these high intensity, high repeat activities with a ketogenic state. There are ways to do it. Um, you can have some carbohydrate before the activity. Maybe you just eat kind of a lower carb, but not necessarily ketogenic level. And by that, you're not saying level. eat a bag of Doritos. No, no. For it, clarity. It, it, it's funny. It's not a free pass to go have a Snickers bar. <laughs> no, no. no <laughs> you want to be a little selective with it. Like yeah, a little Mars, bit. obviously. Mars bar, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almond Joy. Yeah. Uh, Got to have a little fat in but there. But honestly, so. though, I, I mean, I encountered it time and time again. People will hear you say that, and they're like, Rob said that I should have a little bit of carbohydrate before I work out. So I had seven donuts. <laughs> right. Okay. Rob did not say have seven donuts. He said have a little bit of carbohydrate. I mean, if that workout is lasting a month and yes. it's the last meal you're going to have. It's not probably going to last good. a month. Yeah. And it yeah. won't be the last meal that they have because seven <laughs> donuts makes you hungry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you recommend if somebody is in – like uh, – broad spectrum where would you grab from for a good carbohydrate source oh, if you're in that world and again i hate absolutes so as broad sure. as you want to go yeah it's all i'll use myself as an example so i do brazilian jiu-jitsu a fair amount like five days a week and i mainly am keto fueled so i i have been eating ketotic for quite a long time now i guess and uh it's not the easiest like i feel really good in general on that but fueling jiu-jitsu is kind of tough so in general, I'm eating this kind of ketogenic, you know, ratio of protein, carbs, fat, although I do eat a little bit higher carb than many people do on a ketogenic diet because I think I've done it long enough and I'm lean enough and my activity level mm -hmm. is high enough that I still go in and out of ketosis all the time. But then right before a training session, I'll kind of gauge like who shows up that day. <laughs> And if it looks like a pretty mellow day, then yeah. I may just actually have a little bit of MCT powder that I've mixed in water okay. and I'll have that. And that'll actually bump my ketones a little bit. You can't go crazy on the MCT or it will, it will cripple you with the shit. So I, uh, every time I talk about MCT oil, I give the warning that if you're new, wear a diaper and start small. Because oh, you, until you've had that experience of not being able to leave the bathroom, like you think you're done and you're not done. No, you're ne you never really are done. Yeah. I've, I've had that on a road trip. It was awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, 
it, it, it's a it's a cool thing to give to the overachiever that you know because you're like dude no really one tablespoon they're like yeah fuck you i'm gonna do three and i'm gonna do like, two cups so like exactly. yes exactly that was exactly what i was hoping you yep. do so like i'll, I'll get to jujitsu i'll kind of survey the scene and if it, it looks like it's going to be a mellow but fun general role i really don't need additional carbs um, if it looks like a couple of the meat eaters have shown up that day, or if I'm just going to get after it a little bit more that day, I actually ended up buying these, um, glucose tabs for diabetics and it's just really? pure dextrose and it's a, a five gram tablet and I'll have one of those. If it's a little bit of a moderate day, I'll have two, basically I'll have about two of those per hour of hard rolling and I'll, I'll sip on the MCT and that seems to work pretty well. And that's, if people want to dig into that, it's called a targeted ketogenic diet, TKD. I'm surprised by the proximity to the activity that you're, that you're fueling. I mean, if you listen to, you know, don't swim after 90 minutes of eating, right, you know, most right. people, I would honestly, I would have guessed off the top of my head that you would have fueled like an hour or more before that. Because you're literally talking about being there, being there, surveying and, like, yep. oh, it's on, motherfucker, yeah, and yeah. popping it. So, so like we're doing, we're doing drilling and they're like, okay, we're going to do live rolling. So I go over to get a sip of water, grab my mouthpiece and I pop it in right then. Wow. So, okay. it, and this again, maybe gets out into the weeds a little bit. I don't think it's a glycogen deficiency issue, like in my muscles. Like once you keto adapt, you actually end up repleting glycogen at a pretty good clip, just using protein and the little bit of carbs you eat and also fat, like the backbone of the fat provides some, some, uh, substrate that can get turned into glycogen. But what happens like with CrossFit or, or jujitsu, but I would say CrossFit in particular, although ketosis is good at maintaining blood glucose levels because of the the ketone production something that is full body like combatives or crossfit it will suck your blood glucose levels down like crazy it's like a trapdoor it, it, it it's literally like a trapdoor like it plummets and when it plummets like that there's no way possible with our physiology to get the ketones high enough to be able to to plug the gap in that which is part of the reason why i might use a little bit of like ketone salt or I, I kind of prefer the MCT oil. Like I'm trying to goose my ketones up a little bit, but there's a reality that there's, there's just not going to be enough glucose for what we still need. Like our red blood cells have to have glucose, non-negotiable. And if it drops too low, your red blood cells can actually lice and, and die, which sounds amazing. Isn't really great. Sounds great. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that some of the overtraining experience that people have from keto and uh, uh, high intensity training is not so much from a lack of glycogen, but it's from this really big blood glucose drop. And so like taking 10 grams of glucose before the event, it gives you a buffer on that. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of titrate that out as, as your training. And I think that that's kind of the benefit of the targeted ketogenic diet because people will, the really like uh, low carb jihadis, like they're just religious over the stuff. It's actually a really good description. It, it's, it's unfortunate, <laughs> but it's, gosh, <laughs> man, I never understood as a kid. I'm like, how can like Protestants and, and Methodists or whatever, like it, it, how are these guys like fighting each other? And now I fully understand it. You yeah. know, like, it's just these, you, you know, a grain of sand and you like, you, yep. you launch this whole other religious deal around it. But, um, People will rightly point out, they're like, no, your muscle glycogen isn't depleted, so that, that shouldn't be a limiting factor in doing high-intensity activity. Now, these individuals don't actually do any high-intensity activity, but they'll pontificate about, you know, you should be able to keto fuel XYZ activity. And, there, you know, there's genetic variances. Like, um, my understanding currently is uh, just based off genetic variation. If you were to highly train people to be as good at mobilizing fat as possible, you could have people as low as like 0.1 grams per minute, maybe 0.3 that they could use as a, a fat adapted athlete all the way up to like two grams per minute. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so you've got, you know, like two orders of magnitude difference between, so you could have some people that are really, really good at burning fat as a primary fuel source, and they may be able to do some of that high intensity activity, even just with a, a pretty paltry amount of carbs. And then other people just going to be a bad fit for them. You know, if they have a neurological condition or something that would argue to use a ketogenic diet, then maybe need to use MCT oil 
to get the, the ketone bodies yep. higher. Maybe they do do a little bit of intermittent fasting and uh, they keep their carb level moderate, but not super low because it, it, you know, it's just not a good fit for them. But this is where it, you know, it's tough. Um, the 30,000 foot level that you try to introduce people to, they want to like sketch that into stone and turn it into religious doctrine. And then you've got all this nuance and all this detail and, and then there is a reality that that 30,000 foot level will get you 80% there, yeah. you know, but then that remaining 10, 20% is all this nuance. Okay. What are your genetics? What's your sleep? And 90% all that type of, of the people aren't going to take that extra 10 to 20%. And they don't need to. I was going to yeah. say, if yeah. you could, I mean, if, if you look around, just to go to the airport, I'll be at the airport today. And what do I do? I people watch. Right. I don't externally judge. I internalize all of that. <laughs> um, if people had an eighty percent improvement solution for the vast majority of people in our society, oh my God, that's all they need. Yes, yeah. and they, their quality of life would be it would be on that escape trajectory, right? For a long, long time. Yes. Um, so, I I would say, anecdotally, most people are not on a ketogenic diet, right? How? Talk me through. How in the hell do you get started? Like where you have somebody comes in like, Rob, I'm, I feel like I'm going to die. Here's my, I'm on the Western diet. I right. overeat. I eat uh, seven small meals a day by small, I mean a large dinner plate. <laughs> right. um, you know, that's another thing that's amazed me traveling the world. Like I'll order dinner and they hand me like an appetizer plate. I was like, excuse me, I need nine of those. Right, right. But then if you're there for two weeks, you're totally you satiated. It. Yeah. It's amazing. But those first three days, they suck. Right. Let's be honest. Right. So somebody comes to you like, Rob, man, I need help. Um, uh, they haven't done the DNA testing yet, but it's something that they'll, let's say they swabbed and they're waiting for the results. How do you march somebody towards that ketogenic diet and keep them on there? And the compliance, I think we were joking about before, like that's that's the hard part for me too. I mean, it's right. I know the information, but God damn it, mint chip ice cream is good. Right, right. <laughs> now there's Halo Top, though, which isn't the worst thing in the world. I wouldn't say I've, it's great. What is this Halo Top? It, it's kind of a low-carb ice cream, and some of the flavors are pretty damn good, and some of them you can go just straight to hell. stick, no. stick to mint the cardboard. Chip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, chocolate chip cookie, though, because uh, Jocko likes mint chip, and I refuse to let him uh, tell me what's good. Oh, in that space, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> chocolate chip cookie dough, people. <laughs> With possibly a chaser of mint chip, yeah. Um, like a side scoop. So, so, you know, if, uh, so we have a clinic here in Reno where we work with police, military, fire. We work with general population. If somebody comes in the door and they're kind of nosing around about the idea of a ketogenic diet, I want to know why. Yeah. Because there are basic buy-ins that are way easier that may provide all, maybe, you know, all or most of the benefits. So I kind of want to know why. And if somebody relates, um, th th there could be a variety of reasons, just curiosity. Like I hear that mental health, you know, cognition may be improved. I'm a computer programmer. It'd be great if I got another hour of productivity out of my day or whatever. Um, uh, I have type two diabetes on both sides of my family. I have a, a tough time controlling my appetite. Like there are some really compelling reasons to tackle this, but I would encourage people to, to first just look at something that's kind of paleo-esque, like a whack of protein at every meal, some vegetables, some fruit, some good fat. If you have something grain-like, have it as a condiment, not a, not mm -hmm. a main deal and start with that. And to your point, like if they've been living in the snack aisle, just doing that is going to be a big ask on yeah. these people. The compliance part, again. Compliance is, is going to yeah. be challenging. And, you know, to that compliance piece, there, there's two things that I, I find that are poisonous. And the first one is this concept of cheating. Cheating, when you really look at the, the kind of Webster's Dictionary, it's to take unfair advantage against someone else. Mm -hmm. When you deviate from an eating plan... You deviated from an eating plan. You did not take unfair advantage of someone. And and this goes back a little bit. You're you know, almost to, rewarding yourself, actually. You're, yeah. And, <laughs> and but, but what's interesting is, um, and this gets into a little bit of geek land, but all primates have this really strong sense of equality and reciprocity. Oh, you did something good for me today. So, man, I really, I, I owe you. You know, mm -hmm. and there's like this... It, 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 they think that the reason why we're able to do calculus is being able to keep track of who I owe what obligations to and, and vice versa. I can see and that. Th that's okay. kind of the neural architecture for being able to, to, to do, you know, calculus is, is that, that whole process. 
Well, guilt is a big deal in a, a communal society because it, you think about a hunter-gatherer society where everybody is kind of taking care of each other. I'm not feeling great today, so you're going to pull more of the load, but I'm definitely going to do it later. But if you have somebody who's consistently a drain on the team, on the, the community, that they're going to be out at some point. Yeah. Like it, it's going to become a poison. And so guilt is a really big deal. Like it is a really powerful modifier of behavior. And so if you apply guilt to this idea of cheating on your diet, you're applying an emotion that is really legit and really powerful, but to a completely inappropriate state. You deviated from an eating plan. You didn't cheat on your wife or steal money or, you know, whatever this stuff is. And so then people are carrying an emotional, like, punch that is totally inappropriate and ends up just kind of spinning them off. And so the second book that I wrote, I had a whole chapter kind of on, on this concept, which, you know, you don't cheat with food, you eat food. There's consequences. If you know that you react to gluten, like I know I react to gluten. I I tried deviating and having a beer here and there and stuff like that. (laughs) And it just wasn't worth it. If it's worth it for you, by all means, go for it. But you know, you, uh, the, this is just a thing that the cheat day is a poisonous concept. I'm not saying don't have something off plan, but fucking don't call it a cheat day. It's just like, hey, I'm I'm just eating this. Yeah. Generally, I eat this way. Today, I'm going to eat this. And then the, the second piece on the compliance is that people will have one meal that's off plan and they're like, oh, fuck it. I'm, I'm done. Like it, it, it perfection. I, I know somebody like that. <laughs> <laughs> is where, he is he dressed where, patriotically today yes. or <laughs> it's like all right where's the nachos oh yeah. and usually you know what i always do to myself i'll start again on monday exactly you know what the exactly. problem is with that when you say that to yourself monday afternoon it, it, you, you say it on tuesday is the no, problem you say it monday <laughs> afternoon you're like i'll start again on monday i right. get seven days right right yeah it's easy oh my god the momentum that builds yeah. with those that and we'll you know, it's it's easy to make irrational food choices with things that taste really, really, really oh, totally, good. Oh, totally, totally. It's good. <laughs> it's good survival wiring. I mean, it, it really is. But you know, that, so that one meal off plan, it's either Monday or it's the next meal. Yeah. Like, and and so you've just got to wrap your head around. You're gonna. You may just be thrown into a situation where you just don't have good options, and you're really hungry, and you're like, "Dude, I I, I got to eat." I've got a question for you on that later on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so you know, do the best you can with those options, and just recognize that. Okay, I'm only one meal away from being back on track. Yep. And if you think about it, if we eat three meals a day, seven days a week, that's 21 meals. If 19 or 20 of the meals are on point and one or or two are off, now granted off, like if you make it a 10,000 calorie bender, that it, it, <laughs> this is again the always and never. Like we have to have yeah. some some bounds. First of off, 10,000 kind of, calorie. What kind of pussy are you? Well, 15 to 20,000. That's the minimum. appetizer. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> maple syrup goes fine on broccoli. Well, it really goes pretty damn well on everything, and yeah. if it's salty and you got the sweet, oh, then God. you're really on. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But those are the two things that I find being really poisonous with folks. But again, back to your question about like doing a ketogenic diet, I would recommend just trying to clean up and have a whole food yep. diet first. And like you said, that is, um, I've done it. It's, it's your body feels weird. Yeah. It's painful. Yeah. Your body tells you, no, I don't like this. Or you get this. I, I realized, I mean, obviously I've gone on and off throughout my life, but I have an irrational habit when it comes to eating. It's not that I'm hungry. I'm just used to eating at this time. Right. And before you know it, you're like halfway through a meal, like, wait a minute, I'm not actually hungry. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that all, it's it's uh, it's a rocky road. Yeah, yeah. And but, I'm not but, talking ice cream. And I'm not talking ice cream uh, <laughs> or mint chip. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, like I, f- I feel like just starting people at that kind of whole yeah. foods, kind of paleo leaning, you know, definitely make sure you get enough protein, which um, about a gram of protein per, per uh, or about a, a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass is a, a good place to start with that. Like and maybe a little higher, a little lower. But In that dietary structure you're talking about, just cleaning it up, your body's fuel source, you know, ketogenic is mostly drawing from fat, right? Mm-hmm. In that cleaned up diet environment, what is your body's main fuel source there? It's interesting, even though you can still eat a decent amount of carbs, but if we control insulin levels, it will spontaneously shift to being more fat centric. Okay. And this is something that's maybe worth mentioning. Like uh, uh, in my second book, I recommend that people do some blood glucose testing to see how they react to different foods. 
this is something a really important thing like even if you're like oh low carb diets are ridiculous or whatever this is a really important thing for folks to take away somebody who is good at m handling carbs when they eat a carbohydrate rich meal and we graph their blood glucose level it's got a little rise and then a, a nice flat it doesn't go super low mm -hmm. when i eat a high carb meal the blood sugar goes really high and then it crashes the low the, someone who's good at handling carbs has a blood glucose response that looks like me eating a low carb diet and however you eat you need to figure out a strategy so that your blood glucose you don't get super highs and super lows like you if you're going to avoid diabetes, neurological conditions, uh, cardiovascular disease, by hook or by crook, you've got to figure that out. But what really gives people a hip fake is some people can eat a lot of carbs mm -hmm. and they are still metabolically healthy. And what's interesting, even though they're eating a lot of carbs, those carbs trickle into their metabolism, but they're burning body fat with it because they're not insulin resistant. So even though they eat a lot of carbs, they are still kind of fat fueled because they're burning body fat and carbs together. Well, you and Nick, you're a great example. I remember you posting, you guys would eat the same meal and measure the difference. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, I don't know if it was astronomical, but let's just say it was it divergent was for sure. huge. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with a 50 gram, like basically one cup of rice cooked, my blood sugar would get into the Which, 190s. Let's be honest, nobody's eating one nobody's cup eating of rice. Nobody's eating one cup of rice, you know, <laughs> not even me. Yeah. And But my blood sugar would get to 190 at, at the two hour level, which is kind of technically diabetic. And I felt like shit and I had blurry yeah. vision and all this stuff. And then Nikki's might get to 120, 121 at two hours. With none of those symptoms, I'm assuming. None of those symptoms. And you have to keep in mind also, she's 30 pounds lighter than I am. So like just if, if I took a sugar and poured it in a bucket that was 30% smaller, you know, it, it's, it, it, you're going to have a higher concentration yeah. there. So her blood sugar should have gone up more. It, had we scaled it based off of our size, her blood sugar would have probably been like 110. Yeah, because she would have had even less. Because she would have had even less. And and so this is where, although Nikki kind of just eats on the lower carb side of things because I cook the bulk of the meals, like she has way more flexibility on this stuff. Um, she she has a healthier gut. Like everything that uh, about her in that regard is, is better. But like, it, you know, a lot of people will hate on the low carb approach, but you've got to understand like it, some people, if they're going to be healthy, they've got to eat lower carb. Now, yeah. lower carb doesn't mean ketogenic. This is another thing that's funny where people turn this stuff into religious doctrine. I eat may, on, on my harder training days, I eat maybe a hundred grams of carbs total, which is quite a bit higher than the 20 to 30 grams of yep. carbs that they recommend for somebody starting ketosis. And the real diehard keto people, they just freak out and and they forget that there's this whole spectrum called low carb that it, you know it's kind of vaguely defined as like 50 to maybe 150 grams of carbs a day and what's interesting is like atkins protein power life plan from mike eads mark sisson like it, it's very empirical but all these folks tend to start you at a low carb level and all of them kind of finish are kind of like ah, 150 grams of carbs a day is probably kind of the upper limit for most people and if you're eating the bulkier carbs from fruits, vegetables, sweet potatoes, it's kind of hard. It, like you'll you'll be challenged to, to eat to that yeah. 150 gram level. You Go know? ahead and do 150 grams of broccoli. Yeah, yeah, Let yeah. Let me know. Pack a lunch, literally. Right. And a lot a lot of toilet paper <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's ex your jaw muscle will be fatigued before you can get through 150 grams of broccoli. Right, right. Okay, so we're People are like, okay, cool. The chip aisle's bad. So they clean it up. They stay to the periphery of the grocery store where the actual living things are. Right. Or things that we're living. Right. I would even say maybe don't source your meat from the grocery store. Get a relationship with... There's other... Because I agree with you. The uh, animal husbandry. That's actually why I started uh, one of Honey. the main reasons to hunt. I haven't bought meat in almost a year. Oh, wow. It's wow. amazing. And I've nice. got elk, deer, pork... Uh, a variety of species of deer. It's unbelievable. Right. It, and I actually have enjoyed uh, the process of cooking more. And I think more about food now because it's like, ooh, what can I pair this with? Right, right. As it's funny you yeah. really take that stuff seriously instead of it just being like something you grabbed off the supermarket Well, I shelf swept my ass off and was crawling on my face. Yeah, yeah. God, I had the worst experience ever hunting elk because every time I eat it, I'm like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> You're so good. I got you. Not you that I was actually after, but I encountered this guy, so I got him. So <laughs> karma's a bitch. 
So but let's say somebody wants to take the next step. They're like, all right, I'm having great results, but they do the DNA testing and it comes back, hey, you would, your body would do well on a ketogenic diet. How do they make that? I don't want to say it's a leap. How do they make that transition to keto? So first, I would do something like checking out the keto gains macronutrient calculator. So if people Google keto gains macronutrients, yep. they will get, land on this page that will ask them to input their weight, their body fat level. And for the body fat level, it's really easy to, to get pretty close on this. You do another Google search, body fat level, open up the images, and there are these curated, uh, the cartoons are actually better, men and women, and it's like 2 to 4%. You just four pick to your six. body type? And you just kind of look, no and I would recommend kind of pick on the higher side. And, and compared to getting somebody to do calipers and everything, yeah. you're within like two to five percent, which is plenty. It's a it's enough, you know, for for the, again the yep. vast majority of people. So it's going to ask you for your your weight, your body fat percentage. You can figure out the body fat percentage by finding that image, and then it will ask you your activity level. Virtually all of us are sedentary. Stop it. it. <laughs> I'm moderate to extreme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's why whenever I would put that stuff in, I would continue to get fat. And then yeah. when I was like, oh, yeah, I really am sedentary. Yeah. Then, yeah. Um, I it, So virtually everybody is sedentary. And then it will spit out a, a caloric and macronutrient recommendation. Uh, protein, carbs, fat. Uh, for a uh, keto model. For a keto model. Okay. And then from there, you have to start thinking about, okay, how am I going to put together a meal plan around this stuff? And and a shameless plug, I've got a thing called the Keto Masterclass, which walks you through this whole process. And it's got tons of meal plans that are you, you know specific to what your protein carb fat yep. ratio is. But short of that, you've just got to, you know, like you need to poke around on my fitness pal or something, I would recommend figuring out a battery of five meals. That, uh, so like chicken, beef, pork, fish, your something like that. Your go-to staples. Your go-to staples and figure out how much chicken, how much beef, how much pork, how much fish. And that's what, and then I would break it into three meals a day. So if you have 120 grams of protein that you need a day, measure out, four, figure out what 40 grams of each one of those are. Yep. I would just stick to three meals a day and keep all of them uniform. It just simplifies all this stuff, you know? And then if you've got 30 grams of carbs a day, three meals, 10, 10 each, say like you've got 70 or uh, uh, 200 grams of, of uh, uh, fat, then you would partition that into three different, different yep. servings and that's it. And then, you know, so uh, people usually don't eat with that much variety anyway. They're just kind of eating shitty food within the variety they have. I drive my wife nuts. Uh, I could literally eat the same thing yeah. for like a year. Yeah. And I don't care if it's hot or cold. And she put that in the microwave. And my response is, aren't I the one eating it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess if it's like gross enough that it makes your spouse well, it's like, nauseous it's like looking steak. at it. I'll right. eat, I don't care if right. steak is cold or care. chicken. Yeah. It tastes better in the microwave than it's to you. Then you have to slow down because it's yeah. got a hot spot. It tastes in better it to you. Yeah. I like it cold. I can ingest it quicker. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So but get your staples. Get your so calculate your macros, figure out what what um you know, three meals a day of some variety looks like. And then you just have to get in and, and start doing it. And another really hugely overlooked piece to starting a ketogenic diet, when your blood glucose drops and your insulin drops, you you end up excreting salt like crazy, sodium. And this can be good for people who have high blood pressure and, mm -hmm. and they're overweight. But a lot of people experience this thing called the keto flu or the low carb flu. So you need to really aggressively supplement with sodium in particular, also maybe a little potassium and magnesium. Any it, particular type of sodium you'd recommend? Table salt's fine. Like it, you have to do a fairly aggressive amount. And but it, Himalayan it, salt is more expensive. Is it better? It, well, you know, they, they extract, what they do is they give uh, uh, monks kidney infections. <laughs> And then they pee in a jar and they collect it. And that's the pink undertone is kind of the, the hemolysized red blood cells that came out of that. Perfect. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I just stick to the Mortons with okay. some iodine in it. Yeah, Fair enough. Cause, cause it does, but, I mean, it really just kind of any, any salt. I would kind of recommend iodized salt because um, when people start shifting uh, paleo or keto, they tend to limit salt intake and it, it, inadvertently they kind of limit some iodine sources. So some people can end up with some thyroid issues because of kind of limited iodine. Uh, but again, if, if folks go to keto gains electrolytes, just search that 
there's a whole how to cheat sheet on this and you basically make this stuff called keto aid and it's like um it, it you figure out a six serving deal with this and you add the salt you add the magnesium you add a little lemon juice some stevia fill it up and it's like a lemonade deal and then you just drink a oh, certain cool. amount of that each day and it's dead simple but it is non-negotiable if you're gonna go low carb i would even say maybe on the paleo side if you've been kind of uh, a higher carb you know more yeah. refined carb person i would supplement with sodium pretty aggressively because a lot of people that experience define for me aggressively i mean you're putting a good amount you're, on you're there putting, um so a minimum is in addition to basic background diet an additional five grams of sodium a day which a teaspoon of of salt table salt is 50%, a little bit less, uh, about 40% sodium. Okay. So it, it, and, and that will provide about two grams. So you're, you're oh, wow. supplementing about two teaspoons at least a day of electrolytes. And that's for like an average sized person in average heat and humidity, average activity level. When I'm doing jujitsu, and particularly if I get roped into like every place is closed, it's a weekend, it's hot, and we're doing jujitsu in my garage and it's 94 degrees in there, I may end up supplementing 10 grams of sodium that day. Wow. And if I don't, I just feel like shit. I was going to say, yeah. you, uh, what yeah. the difference has got to be in how you feel. Yeah. And, and it's funny, I've been eating this way a long time, but I'll, I'll be motoring along, but I've had a really active day. And then I'm like, man, I'm just not feeling that good. And I'm like, oh, I haven't had my electrolytes in eight hours or something like that. And I'll mix oh. up some electrolytes, shoot it down. and, and It's pretty rapid. It, it's funny. It's like five minutes later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's immediate. So um, calculate the macros, figure out a meal plan that's simple and repetitious. And once you get your head around that stuff, then you can start adding some variety. But give yourself a month of just some kind of monotonous eating and, and, you know, but, but make it really simple and make, if, if you're not willing to invest as much time in the electrolytes as you are, the other stuff, don't even bother doing it. Like it, it, it is such a non-negotiable fee. Okay. It is that critical. And I never really appreciated it that much, but this is also why I had kind of intermittent, um, uh, success with it. And also if you're wanting to do more high intensity activity, the um the the electrolytes are a non-negotiable part of that. Yeah. So there's one elephant in the room that I can see on this. John Wellborn. He is definitely a large, large man that can swallow <laughs> you up when he gives you a hug. All of this sounds good for health, but what about booze? booze. Is it possible <laughs> to do a ketogenic diet and still drink? Yeah, but it's it. Uh, Yes. What you have to do is kind of, uh, <laughs> you have to allocate your carb allotment yep. to the, uh, the, the booze. Um, if somebody really, and, and this is, you know, it's funny. Um, again, when we were running our gym, we had a lot of realtors because at some point in Chico, like everybody was a real estate agent. Yeah. Just until that was, bubble until, you were until talking Until they about. weren't. Yeah. yeah. They were just selling each other back and forth uh, yep. uh, houses, somehow making money out of that. But um, what one of the things we noticed, so, it, it, you know, we would get dietary compliance out of our real estate agents because if they look better, they sold more houses. You're just more attractive, whether you're male or female, you're going to sell more shit. You, you know, want to no, admit it or not, it's the truth. Right, yep. right. And so that was one positive piece, but the negative piece is also drinking is kind of the social lubricant. And so some some of our our uh, real estate agents, they're like, I'm not selling as many houses because I'll take people out and wine them and dine them. And when I relax, like I'm funnier and I'm able mm -hmm. to close these deals. So we developed the NorCal Margarita, which was two shots of tequila, juice of one lime, splash of soda water. So it was just like the least amount of calories you could get into somebody they could shoot one of those down on an empty stomach, totally get their head changed, have some protein and fat, <laughs> and then just like sip off of one or two of those throughout the rest of the evening. Yep. And then they're, they're, they're in two to four drinks of alcohol, but the total caloric load is tiny compared to beer, wine, mixed drinks, all that yeah. stuff. So I kind of steer people towards like, you know, a, a gin on the rocks or whatever the, whatever the thing is to kind of minimize that and and you know honestly if um if somebody's really geeked out on drinking like it's just part of their social being 
I would kind of recommend just being kind of low carb paleo yeah. and not really having the the emphasis on that keto state. Like just make it a little easier on yourself. Maybe do a little bit of intermittent fasting. This is funny where I was like, intermittent fasting is not that great, but it even if you try to keep your, your food and booze as early in the, the day as possible and that isn't necessarily like eight in the morning, but yeah. you know, like I was going to say 11, but we, okay. We, on the days that we can pull it off, we start happy hour. Like we'll go out and meet some people for drinks three o'clock. Yeah. But then I'm done by five thirty or six. I go to bed at eight thirty or nine. If I can, if I can get the kids in bed and just shifting that earlier, like the negative impact the booze has on me, it, it's almost like I didn't drink. Yeah. Whereas like if it's three hours later, I'll yep. definitely notice the impact on my sleep and all that stuff. Now, granted, I know not everybody can pull off a schedule like that, but just to the degree possible, shifting food and booze earlier in the day is, is going to be a, a, a win. The reality is, too, most people probably aren't going to stop at two cocktails. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, because, I mean, yeah, if you're trying to go <clears throat> keto and that's a part of who you are or your social circle, you're never really going to get the ketogenic state, right? Because you have all of that you will, and you may be intermittent, but and this gets out in the weeds a little bit, but being in the ketogenic state may mo- make alcohol more toxic to the liver. It's really? not 100% certain, but it's possible. And it's just enough of a concern. I, I mean, so when you're in a bar, there's bar food and all, all the rest of that. But even then, you know, like chicken wings are pretty easy to kind of fit within, you know, like a wink, wink, nod, nod, paleo kind of. Yeah kind of concept. So that's where I would just say, hey, try to limit other carbs, but don't put the added pressure of like trying to be in ketosis or whatever. Like uh, uh, just try to generally eat whole unprocessed foods, lean towards that paleo side of things. Um, You know, you you can definitely try to affect that ketogenic state, but it it just, it just seems like a lot, you know? It it is a lot. You're going to be juggling and shuffling your life quite a bit for happy hour yeah and it, it, it like and then is it really happy hour it seems like unhappy yeah. hour at that point so here's a question for you uh and this one came from a conversation recently you know the the stuff that you're talking about is if you have a controlled environment you're at your house let's say you don't travel a lot for work it's a lot easier in that controlled environment and it's the same thing in, in the military largely as well too like before pre-deployment i'm home i'm cooking my meals uh, and then you have to go somewhere right? and you switch from, you know, you're doing your three meals per day. You you know, you went to the keto gains, you got the macro, uh, the macronutrient chart broken out and you have the ability to really control the input and then you have to go somewhere. And the term somebody, a buddy of mine used was basically crisis nutrition. Right. Uh, and I'll use hunting as an example because we're getting ready to start hunting season. It's, you were up probably an hour and a half to two hours before sunrise mm-hmm. because you you know the golden hour is as the sun is coming up the animals are moving then throughout the day you're of course chasing and pestering them right and then in the evening you have a golden hour as well and in that t- and everything I'm going to eat it's in my bag right. right it's on my backpack I might have something staged at a truck uh, fluid intake as well as part of this so mm-hmm. I went from this environment where it's like yes I could almost set an alarm on my phone very controlled and now I'm in a crisis state for. 10 days. Right. What do you recommend? Man, so that's an interesting argument for a ketogenic state, or at least a really well fat adapted state, because if you're really relying on fat as a primary fuel source, you aren't as prone to having problems in between meals. And so even though you're still going to need to fuel while you're hunting, they could be less frequent. They could be larger calories. Like w- when you get ready, right, you're like, okay, I'm going to hunker in and I'm just going to sit in a stand or, you know, wherever well, and it I gets, am. And it gets uh, interesting too, because the energy expenditure can wildly shift. Like yes. Western hunting, for example, we have one in late September and there's multiple thousand foot mountains at a high right. angle. And you could easily go from sitting to, oh my God, there's the herd of elk. We have to get up there before them. You're no longer burning fat on that climb, right? You know? Right. So again, that's it's almost like, oh my god, I'm so far outside of my controlled environment. I'm in a crisis. Wh- I mean, like, I'm open to any suggestions you may have on so, the strategy. So that's interesting on that. So like, if you were fat adapted, and then let's say you had those glucose tabs, mm-hmm. which they pack great. They can't spoil. You could yep. dump them out of the plastic. Uh, although you might want to keep them in a hard shell container, otherwise, if they get mashed up, you're gonna have to like yeah, most snort the time. them. So yeah. 
Oh, um, interesting. I didn't know. All right. <laughs> now we're getting but, off the rails. But so, <laughs> let, so let's say if you're, it, it, you know, it's funny. This is some of the recommendations I gave when I was doing the, the resiliency program work. You know, if you know. Well, it's not dissimilar. Because we don't know the energy expenditure, and it could be peaks and valleys. Right. And yep. so if you know you've got something going on, then you do, you know, like uh, uh, 30 to 60 grams of caffeine, maybe a little bit of nicotine. This is, And we can talk about yep. that, that stuff later. But, you know, like you can get appropriate dosing on that. that uh, and this is like a half to a quarter cup of coffee. So this is something that folks need to appreciate. If you want to use caffeine and nicotine as ergogenic age, you, you can't do the you know the standard slug of coffee because you, you can't you've do totally a venti over, it, caramel it, macchiato it, it, you can but you're not going to get the benefit <laughs> when you want it and and so like let's say you see a, a herd of elk and you're the fat adapted person you see them uh you know about a mile off but you you've got to try to yep. get high ground on them and you've got wind to it's deal gonna with it's going to be high intensity for it's sure it's going to be intensity, intensity for yep. sure so you could put down maybe like 30 to 40 milligrams of caffeine, which would be about a quarter cup of coffee, but it would be a little bit more than that, maybe about 50 grams of, of caffeine. And then you could do, if you're that fat adapted person, maybe you find one of these MCT type cookies or, or chocolate things, you Ooh, slam one of those MCT down. MCT cookie. Right yeah, like down. there's a keto cups, I think, or one of the, the folks. And it's it's nice that most of the hunting happens more in the fall because some of the stuff melts. So you, you know, some of the areas warm, can get hot though too. And that's another variable. So you have to think about that. Yeah. It's like okay, I can't bring this part of the the gear because again, it's, crisis it's, it's gonna melt. crisis nutrition. Yeah, you're trying to manage, not right. uh, thrive. But then these uh, these glucose tabs, it would be like me getting ready to go do the jujitsu session. So you're a little heavier than I am. So mm -hmm. you might do like three of them, fifteen grams of glucose. And then you just start jamming. And the, the cool thing about the glucose tabs is if you feel yourself kind of kind of flagging a little bit, like you can just pop one in and, yeah. and go. They pretty quick uh, response as very well. Very quick response, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean minutes. And, and uh, this is how you're able to pull somebody who is hypoglycemic and diabetic, like it'll pull them back from the, the brink pretty quickly, yeah. Okay. But that would be an interesting strategy, you know, because um, if you're mainly fat adapted, on a calorie by calorie basis, packing fat is the lightest stuff to bring. Um, interestingly, out on the trail, if water is a concern, you actually want to eat at the lower protein side of things. So if you have a high work output, you don't want to go super low protein because you, if you deplete all the branch chain amino acids out of your blood, you're left with tryptophan at high concentration in the blood and you'll get sleepy. Mm -hmm. Like they've actually had... Uh, marathon runners, like they're running along and they just fall asleep because they're, they, they tank their glucose, tank their branched chain amino acids. Tryptophan gets so high that it, it, it converts into melatonin. That's ultimately. excellent. I'm going to yeah. actually spend some time on YouTube watching that. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> interesting. So you want a little bit of protein, but when you're, when you're, um, when your body is processing protein, it requires a lot of water. So you could make an argument for during these um, hunting periods, let's say normally at home, you're doing one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. Maybe on the trail, you do a half a gram of protein per pound of lean okay. body weight. Then that leaves you a lot more allocation that you can put towards fat, which is light and easy to, to manage and all that stuff. And so like, if you're literally going to be living out of your pack, you become keto adapted. Um, you shift your protein to the low end of the, the spectrum for that three days or week or whatever. And then whenever you have a sense that you're going to have like a, a high intensity activity that's going to pop up on you, you pop down anywhere from five to 10 grams of uh, carbs from a glucose tablet. And just get after it. And just get after it. Yeah. What, what about the guy who, or the hunter who's starting off and they don't have time before the season to really get to that fat adapted state, but they can clean it up. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend they bring into the field? What kind of stuff? Just so cleaning stuff up as a baseline, clearly like doing the basic aerobic work to just build some, some decent aerobic capacity, doing some basic strength training so that, and really get familiar with your, your gear. Yeah. Like just wear that stuff to the store if you can to like it, it work hard in towns. You, that's or, better than others. Well, right. We live up in Montana. You live in acceptable. Montana. So it's totally acceptable. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, get as familiar with your, your gear as, as possible. And that just gets into the work hardening and everything, like where yep. you're going to chafe and, and all that stuff. And then from there, um, you know, you could make similar recommendations, but if you're not super fat adapted, then you're going to have to have some carbs in the mix. But this is where like 
kind of trail mix or pemmican or something like that. So like in, what I've done is I'll take a, like the Trader Joe's Omega trail mix. See it, it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it has uh, cranberries and ra- uh, mainly cranberries, a little bit of raisins, and then a, a mixture of nuts. So I'll take that and I'll, I'll put it in a Pyrex flat dish and then I'll pour coconut oil over that so that really? it's covered and then I can cut that into cubes. You're making your own bars, essentially. Basically making my own bars with yeah. that. But I, I will use that when I know that my work output is going to be consistently higher because then I've got that background level of carbohydrate in the mix. Yeah. But the, the, the concern there is you definitely, uh, uh, coconut products like that, MCT products, they melt at about 85, 89 degrees or something like that. That could be problematic for people depending on where they are. Yeah. So you just have to keep that in mind. And so like, if you know that you're going to be in a warmer environment, then it's just trail mix and jerky. And then, you know, whatever your freeze dried stuff yep. is. But again, I could make an argument that for that, that, uh, period in the woods, like you don't necessarily want a super high protein intake because it increases your, your water needs. I had never thought about that. And like the number one go-to in my bag usually is beef jerky. Which is great. But if you, and if, if you never are getting tight on water, then it may not be that big of an issue. Yeah. If you have kind of a, a ubiquitous water supply, then that's, that's Which not is a an problem. unknown. So it, it's I, a super unknown. So I yeah. plan for the water on my back is the water I'm going to get. Okay. I've had some bad experiences with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so reducing protein. But yeah. even then, like, uh, so you look at um, how much protein are you eating from beef jerky? Because, I mean, it's it's hard to eat the equivalent that you would get out of, like, a tomahawk steak or something like that. Not in a like Costco it. bag. Well, we might shop at different places. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Generally, I tap out on it before that, but yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I, well, I just I'm thinking back on the stuff I normally carry, and it's I mean, there's I probably have too much protein in the field relative to fat, relative to fat, and the amount of water that I'm comfortable carrying over a long term because it's freaking heavy, right? You know what I mean? Right. Seven pounds a gallon. I mean, it'll get after it. All right, here we go. Top three foods that not a single human being should ever touch. Or ingredients. I'll let you even go. Oh, man. I don't know that I would go ingredients, but... No, I'm letting you choose between the two. Uh, Ingredient or food, like, for the love of God, do not grab this and eat it. I wouldn't eat tofu, but soy in (laughs) gluten-free soy sauce is a... uh, I'm I'm cool with that, so long as you're not allergic to it. Um, This is going to be crazy, but uh, wheat or gluten. Yep. If there was one You should probably, let's be honest... Describe a little bit what gluten is, because one of my favorite things to do <laughs> when people tell me that they're looking for gluten-free stuff is to say, what is gluten? Right. And the n- percentage of times that they will look at me and go, I have no idea. <laughs> but I just don't want it. It's yeah. astronomically yeah. high. So since we're on wheat and gluten, again, like kindergarten level, gluten. So gluten is a protein that's found in mainly wheat-type grains, rye, oats, barley, millet, all of them contain gluten or gluten-like proteins. These proteins, they, they don't entirely understand why they exist, like the, what's the role that it plays in the plant, but in humans and, and in other animals, it's interesting. It irritates the gut lining. It irritates the immune system. In certain people, uh, they have a predisposition genetically to develop a, an autoimmune reaction from the celiac, gluten, right? celiac disease. But then you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is an entirely different thing that is caused by another protein, wheat germ, a gluten in. Like wheat itself has thousands of proteins in it. Some of them are problematic. Some of them aren't. Some people have problems. Some of them don't. Um, here's kind of a, a, a wacky example of that. They did a study on children who have celiac disease. So they would, if you looked at a microscope image of their intestines, normally they've got these finger type things sticking up called villi. And these celiac kids, if they've been exposed to gluten, it's just flat. Like these villi are nuked, which makes it really hard to absorb nutrients. They did a fecal transplant on these kids where they basically took poop out of a healthy non-celiac individual, put it in these celiac kids. 60% of the kids were no longer celiac after that. So certain bacteria have the the enzymes to break down gluten-containing grains. So this is a whole other layer to this thing and where it gets really complex trying to do diagnostic medicine around it. it, It's so much easier to be like, hey, man, I know it's crazy, but let's go grain legume dairy free for 30 days, reintroduce, see how you do. So 
but but for a lot of people, gluten ends up being a, a big problem. Um, I would argue that most of the people who develop gallbladder issues, it's caused by a, a gluten type cross reaction, some sort of weak gluten type cross reaction. So, but, you know, soy is really problematic for a lot of people. Uh, wheat or gluten is really problematic. And, and my greasy used car salesman pitch, pull it out for 30 days, reintroduce, see how you do. And particularly in this day and age, we're like, you know, like gluten-free pizza crusts and it, the alternatives, although still carby and uh, mm-hmm. still junk food, like you're not going to get skinny eating a bunch of gluten-free pizza. But if you are that person that's reactive, and I'm kind of shocked by how many people are, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a surprising thing. And your state of, of uh, being reactive or not reactive can change from day to day. This is one, of, I think, one of the reasons why I got pulled in with some of the resiliency work guys would be deployed and like they're they're like wolverine like they're they're just nothing breaks them but then they'll get a gut bug and then they're crippled after that and they notice they're like fuck every time i eat like i'm running to the can yep. immediately and then we do a little bit of tinkering mainly in elimination diets like oh dude you're super gluten reactive and then if the person still wants to be in the military we have to figure out okay how do we improve the digestion so that the gluten isn't as big of a deal because it, it's you're not going to avoid it 100 percent. Like, and you're going to very completely difficult. lose control of your food overseas yes so yeah. it's something to yeah. plan for yeah. all right so tofu is the top of the list tofu, wheat and gluten wheat and you gluten. got one spot left on the uh, rob wolf top three never touch these as a human <sighs> being list Sugared soft drinks. <laughs> yes, I. It, it's just, it's one of those things that that it, it's um. It is so fucking easy to consume calories in liquid form. Yep. Like it, Starbucks it, being a great example. Starbucks the be, venti yeah. caramel macchiato. I was joking about later. Yeah. It's a howitzer of cal- it, uh, calories. It's two hundred grams of sugar or something like that. It's delicious. Yeah, and it's delicious, yeah. But um, <laughs> and a strapping ombre like yourself, you could probably handle that. It would pretty well cripple me. So I do two it, at a time. It's no big deal. Oh, nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I do I, carry an insulin pump. No, so, I yeah. go coffee black if I'm going yeah. coffee. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that we just um, – I do not see people thriving who are consist, uh, consuming any amount of, of uh, sugared – liquid liquid you know and people will get all up in arms over the artificial sweeteners and for someone who's overweight and they've been chronically kind of eating poorly for years i will say even artificial sweeteners they they can kind it's like a gateway drug like it's too many um flavor options for people so they're they're doing pretty good on their kind of whole food eating and then they have the soda and oh man a little bit of chips would taste good too it's and the irrational food choices yeah well it, it it's not irrational it's super rational when you consider our evolutionary biology yep. we had to eat everything that wasn't nailed down because there's no whole foods because there was no whole food oh god <laughs> this, this this gets out in the weeds a little bit but it, it's kind of cool they did a study where they were doing brain imaging on people and they, they educated them about, okay, if you've got a piece of cheese and it looks about this big, it's going to be this many calories. And they did all this education on these people. And they got pretty good at being able to like, okay, that's probably this, that's probably that. But they did single, typically, food sources. Then what they did is brain imaging on folks. And they would show them either a carbohydrate in isolation, like grapes or potato or something, a fat in isolation, or a carbohydrate fat combo like pizza or yep. or ice cream or you know desserts or whatever people were really good at estimating the caloric content of carbs alone or fat alone when you made the combination they were idiots with, <laughs> with and they always <laughs> guesstimated low and and it switched with the fat carb combo the area of the brain doing the analysis switched to the this kind of amygdala, like emotion-driven part of the brain. It's a brand new study, and it's fascinating. But it, um, when you think it, so you're hunting. How often, when chasing down elk, are you running across something that's like a rich fat carb combo? Like it, 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 it like like never. combo never. Yeah. I mean never. Um, it, if you really put put some thought into it, like. You know, in North America, you might find some sweet potato type tubers. You might find some blueberries. Somebody's got to be pulling that down. Then you might get an elk or something like that. And there is, uh, you know, within the uh, Native American um, 
history, they would take this stuff and make basically like kind of like sausage type stuff, mm -hmm. stick berries and tubers and meat and fat into this and cook it. Yep. And it was amazing. And it was the closest thing to like ice cream or pizza that we have. It was the closest thing to a fat carb combo that you could achieve out of the environment. And this is one of the things that, that even, you know, people that poo poo like the paleo concept or whatever, um, even in agricu more agricultural times. So you had dairying, you had butter, maybe you had grains, but it was a lot of work to get to um, a fat carb combo. It's, it, 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 your kids are older, but um, uh, we read our kids the Eric Carle books, you know, like the Very Hungry Caterpillar. And one of them is called- I'm sure we did too, yeah. One of them is called Pancakes, Pancakes. And so this kid's- <laughs> Kid grows up and it looks like they're in kind of like uh, medieval Europe, you know, just, just by the, the clothes they're wearing. He's like, mom, I want some pancakes. She's like, okay, go to the field and cut some wheat. And it follows, you, you got to cut the wheat, yeah. thresh the wheat, grind the wheat. Oh, by the way, we need butter for this. And so you got to milk the cow, churn the butter. Like it's a fucking process, yeah. even in agricultural terms, again, to get the fat carb combos. And this is where I think... Um, if pe even if people are incredulous about like kind of the paleo concept, it, like pull back a little bit and just ask yourself, does it make sense there would be a biological reward for fat carb combos? And would the ubiquity of these things today potentially be problematic? Like could it go beyond, you know, or sedentary and all the rest of that stuff? And uh, I'm not sure how I got onto that, but it, it, it's a, there, there was no whole foods. There was no whole foods. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so the Which whole foods is full of fat carb, carb combos. combos. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And that is the snack aisle. Yeah. It is. Yeah. All right. Two more questions. Cause I know we're limited on time. This one's going back to fasting. Mm -hmm. I get varying answers depending on where I go on the internet <laughs> on this one. If you're in a fasted state, black coffee, does it oh. break the fast? Oh man. You know, it's funny. So I'm working on a three part series, one on fasting, one on this thing called mTOR, which is this this gene that gets expressed when you eat protein, and then the other one on overall health and longevity. And and so this one definitely comes up in the the fasting piece. So the, the way that I answer this is why are you fasting? What's the goal? Because okay. that's really the more, and, and whenever anybody says, should I do intermittent fasting? Rob, should I eat paleo? Well, what do you want to yeah, do? Yeah, what, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you here? trying to accomplish? Because always the context drives this. Okay, where are you? What do you want to do? We now have a roadmap to getting somewhere. So this question about um, does coffee break fasting? Well, why are you fasting? People will say things like, okay, well, I want to do autophagy, where they're getting cell recycling and stuff like that. Okay, coffee makes autophagy work better. So, but the, the, uh, but the one thing that coffee does is it turns on the circadian genes, the biological clock in your liver specifically, and I think possibly the, the digestive tract, but it doesn't do it in the brain. Okay. But in the grand scheme of things, does that really matter? And I would say no. But it, so again, it's goal driven. If your goal is to stimulate autophagy and enhance your uh, antioxidant response and everything, coffee's a fucking win. Yeah. You know, in a in a facet state, in a non caramel macchiato state, in a non caramel, basically a black yes. cup of coffee. You know, for that, clarity, yeah, people here, yeah, the way that God intended the the, <laughs> the stuff. Um, the one caveat to that is that in a fasted state, we naturally tend to be um, more kind of adrenaline driven. Like we've got higher epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, uh, cortisol. And for some people throwing coffee on top of that, like I'm kind of a wound tight type A type of person. If I do too much coffee in a fasted state, like I, I it's a shit show. It's You're a bad into fifth gear. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny if I have some food, then I can, it kind of like calms me down a little bit. Buffers and then the it, a little bit. it buffers it a little bit. And so I, you know, I can do a coffee, maybe two if I'm fasting, but it, it, it's really dodgy. And like, if I have to do public speaking or anything like that, I'm better off doing like a quarter of a cup of coffee if, okay. it, if I'm going to be fasted. But it, it's all context driven. And so the and interesting- based off of your goal. And, and it, based yeah. off your goal. And so if you're talking about autophagy, which is one of the most popular things around fasting, 
coffee dramatically enhances autophagy. Do you know what enhances autophagy more than fasting? Say tequila, please. Lifting weights. Okay. Damn it. That's, and it, I'll take that, though. It, and weightlifting. So there's this stuff called mTOR, which is critical for maintaining muscle mass, but it also can be a factor in the development of cancer. Eating um, protein enhances or uh, 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 it increases the expression of, of mTOR activity, but lifting weights focuses the mTOR activity on the muscles and not the rest of the body. So people get all wrapped around the axle of eating, oh, I'm going to eat no protein and then I won't have mTOR and then uh, I won't get cancer. No, you probably won't get cancer because you're going to die from sarcopenia and you're going to trip and fall and like break your hip and <laughs> be so so weak at the age of 50 that you're, you're, you're never going to develop cancer because you won't live that long. And uh, so this is some of the interesting stuff where people make shit really hard. Yeah. Drinking coffee and lifting weights, you could argue, provides a greater autophagy benefit than fasting. Now, this isn't ex a, a, the all or never thing. It's not entirely true. Like a three to five day fast does do some really interesting stuff. But on a day to day basis, you know, it's like, yeah, have the coffee. Like the all the, and I don't, I'm very careful with epidemiology, but the epidemiology, it's kind of like the more coffee you drink, it seems to be the longer you live. And, yeah. and again, black, not yes. caramel macchiato. It's know, amazing that you have the to add caveat, caveat there. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So last question. Now I save this one for last because it's the best one ever. And I, you need to know that the person who asked me to ask you this, he routinely wears salmon color shorts. So keep that in, <laughs> in the back of your mind. His question, and I quote, does toothpaste break your fast when you're oh, brushing your teeth? In the morning? <laughs> I knew you would love it. Oh, man. I and, have I, a... and I promised him I would ask it because it's. I'm like, okay, I have no idea. We're, we're definitely firing that off. I have a not appropriate response even for your show, which I'll share with you after Perfect. we stop recording. But short answer is no. No. And again, that's it, what I told him. And even anecdotally, I'm like, I don't care if it does or not. You need to brush your teeth. Yeah. And it, it, again, this is where people get wrapped around the axle of the absolutes. And, and uh, I see so many people doing so many things absent a goal. Yep. They're just fucking doing them, you know? And it's like, okay, doing, there is a, a, a something along the lines of like doing a, a Acting without a plan is better than planning without action or, or something like that. You know, there's yep. maybe an argument for something around there. But w when people get hamstrung on like, should I do this or that, sit down and figure out what your fucking goal is. Like, why are you doing this? You a know? vector has to have both an amplitude and a direction. Yes. yes. Absent either one of those, you're spinning it's, out into space. Yeah, it's, it, it's just meaningless. And so many of these questions get answered by like, well, what do you want to do? Okay, you want to do that? Well, where are you today? And we have a vector then. And, and with that, we can retro-engineer a, a process. And sometimes it's not going to be, a, you know, like my, my fasting versus coffee and lifting weights analogy, it's not 100% there, but it is very, it's, it's strongly weighted that direction and it's easy to do. And like I'm so comfortable with the side effects of strength training. It's like it makes people stronger. Yeah. It makes them mentally tougher. I mean, I, I, I just, you know, yes, more strength training. I mean, short of uh, Ronnie Coleman levels of anabolic steroids, like, yeah. you know, it, it's yeah, like a little caveat, a little caveat there, you know, not all <laughs> or nothing there too. Um, but, it, you know, it, and also just from a uh, being a social pariah, you know, it's like, okay, so not everybody's into lifting weights, but like, Everybody likes to have a cup of coffee, maybe tea if you're a weirdo, but yep. you know, it's something totally in there. Weirdo. A total weirdo. And uh uh you know, and then lifting some weights like so it again, like you can get like the social piece of it, which when we see people spin out, like the social difficulties. My husband doesn't support me, my wife doesn't yep. support me, my coworkers actively undermine me and all that. So if you can figure out some ways of not purposefully being the weirdo, like Tim Ferriss talking about like 
don't put the underwear on the outside of your pants. Like yeah. being a little conformist is is okay in those regards, you know. Be and the gray man is what I say. Yeah, you yeah. Don't have to be at the front of the crowd. You it, could still be at the concert and be on the side and get all the experience. Right. And you don't have to wear the t-shirt. It, it, you know. You can have a lot of money and you can have a nice car, but you don't have to have a cherry red Ferrari. You know, it's just like you just put you, or a yellow Lambo or a yellow Lambo. Like it just <laughs> paints a target on you, and if you're surprised by that targeting process you're an idiot you know but but again yeah like uh, uh if people would sit down and just figure out what's the goal it it all all of these questions it, and it's really impossible to answer the question credibly if somebody said should i eat vegan yeah, well stuff. why why should, should i eat paleo well why you know i mean like do you feel good now like if you ever experience what's the goal here because the the context of establishing that goal that's where the nuance comes in and that's where we drop down out of a religious doctrine and we can actually have a conversation practical. about making it practical. Yeah. But it, but at the same time, it kind of builds a bridge between the easy, easy Pareto 80-20 stuff and also it, it helps us bridge the gap to the really specific stuff that the individual needs. Right on, man. Well, I, we're right at the end of the time, but we totally nailed that. So awesome. Two hours on the head. I'm stoked we got to uh, reconnect. We got to do this again. Absolutely. Sure. Right Absolutely. On. Cool. That's it for this week, everybody. Like I said, episode 52. It's a milestone. Took me a little bit longer to get there than it probably should have, but I think we're on a pretty good track right now. Hope everybody's enjoying the content. I've had some variety in guests for sure over the last few weeks, and that actually is going to continue for the next few weeks. And I'm due to do... I'm, wow. I'm due to complete a Q&A at some point. Uh, people are still reaching out with questions, so I will dedicate an episode to a Q&A sooner rather than later. Appreciate everybody who is going onto iTunes and writing a review, rating the podcast, and more than anything, people who are helping me spread the word with the podcast. The feedback that I get, the emails, the messages via social media, I appreciate each and every one of you for taking time to reach out to me. I try to respond to every single one. I can't say that I'm perfect and that I have the time to get back to everyone, but I do my best. And what else? Let's end with the reminder that this episode is brought to you by Blue Chew. Dot com. All right, let's think about it like this. If sex was an Olympic sport, Blue Chew would be banned, all right? Because it's a performance enhancing drug. So, it's a chewable, it works faster than a pill. It's cheaper than Viagra and Cialis, but it's got the same active ingredients, it comes straight to your house. I mean, come on. What else could you possibly need? So, go over to bluechew.com, B L U E C H E W.com. And put in the promo code HOT and get your first order for free. And that is it. I will see everybody next week. See you.